Number five on this list is Atlantis Marine Park. We are headed all the way down under for this one because Atlantis Marine Park is actually in Australia. Australiannews.com writes, Atlantis Marine Park was initially a huge success with families from WA and beyond flocking to the park to watch the live dolphin shows, swim in the pools, ride pedal boats, and have their obligatory photo with King Neptune, a huge statue at the entrance to the park. However, in 1990, just nine years after after opening, Atlantis shut its doors. Western Australia's boom never eventuated and the 1987 stock market crash put a halt to prosperity. Atlantis closed due to financial difficulty and was left abandoned. It has since been damaged by vandals and has become overgrown and derelict. Old statues can still be found scattered throughout the grounds as well as broken walls and concrete pools. For years it was no man's land, popular with dog walkers. However, just last month the iconic King Neptune was restored to its former glory after a petition by locals who started an online campaign for something to be done with the ruins. Well, I'm glad to see that Neptune is looking fresh again, but I don't know how long he'll stay that way. Apparently this place, when the sun goes down, is home to some evil creatures. Four legged mutant things with glowing red eyes that hiss and are nothing that we know of from this world. Now this could be a bunch of baloney, but that's what some people have reported seeing when they've explored this place at night. Probably safe to go during the daytime, just make sure you set an alarm for 6 p.m. to get out of there if you do go. Number four on this list is Crinkly Bottom Theme Park. This one, to my understanding, has been demolished, but it still deserves a spot on this list because of how creepy it was when it was around. Mr. Mr. Blobby was a TV caricature in the early 1990s. He was featured on one of Britain's most successful late night Saturday television shows and was this big pink blob creature with a bow tie on. This was a comedy television show and this blob thing didn't lack any of that. He would often engage in annoying antics with celebrity guests and become a bit of a British television phenomenon. Well, Mr. Blobby was successful enough that he of course needed toys, merchandise, and heck, while we're at it, Let's give him his own amusement park. Sometimes what works well on TV doesn't always translate to a fun amusement park though. Crinkly Bottom was what they called it and it opened up in 1994. This annoying sidekick's popularity didn't last forever though and this amusement park's life was very short lived. The place shut down in 1996 because it simply was not making enough money. Then it faded away into obscurity and everybody forgot about this interesting little business venture. That was until 2009 though when some urban explorers stumbled upon it again. The once bright and beautiful blobby land looked like something straight out of a horror film. It was warm and gross and just reeked of evil. Animals had taken up residence there and based on how the place looked, it wouldn't have been surprising if some sketchy characters once did business there too. You can't visit it now because it's demolished, but you really shouldn't have been going when it was around anyways. Number three on this list is Boblo Island. I had to include Boblo Island on this list to give a bit of a shout out to Ontario, where your boy grew up. Boblo Island was wildly successful for a time and operated for nearly a century. As with a lot of places, is on this list though it couldn't seem to power through the 90s and had to shut down. Reader's Digest says, picture an 1898 Victorian amusement park, music from an organ grinder, women's skirts swishing around the dance hall, children's laughter echoing from various newfangled rides. That's what this theme park on Boys Blank Island, nicknamed Boblo, near Detroit on the Canadian side of the Detroit River was to residents alike. Its doors were shut nearly a hundred years later in 19 1993 and the area is now close to the public, but you can boat or kayak by the remains listening for the ghostly sounds of long past visitors. While you can't stay here overnight, you can rent these eight haunted places on Airbnb. Being on an island really adds to the creepiness for me, I think. Like this place from all the pictures I could find, it really looks totally detached from all other society. Basically meaning that whatever happens here, you are totally by yourself. Like there is a new set of rules for this island. There have been stories that something lurks here. A spirit or something dark. Be very careful if you ever go to Boblo Island. Number two on this list is Pripyat Amusement Park. Pripyat is a town that we've talked a lot about on this channel already. In fact, it was recently featured in a video where we looked at the top five mysterious towns that are completely abandoned. Pripyat is a ghost town in northern Ukraine and near the Ukrainian and Belarus border. It was named after the nearby river Pripyat and was founded in 1970. Right in the town is a small amusement park that once looked quite fun and had plans to grow into a big 
Ukrainian park that people might flock to. Those dreams were never realized though and now it sits in complete and utter disarray. Those dreams were never realized because of the horrible accident that occurred in 1986. You see the town of Pripyat was basically established to serve the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. When it was first built it was a closed town basically only for the workers of this place but it grew and grew as time went on and at its height had a population of just under 50,000 people. I don't need to go into too much detail about the accident as a whole because I imagine that you guys are all pretty aware. But basically this was the worst accident of this nature in human history and for all our sakes we need to hope that it never happens again. The radiation damage was absolutely massive and right after it happened the entire town of Pripyat had to be evacuated. That of course has left the amusement park right in the middle of this town completely abandoned as well. Not a lot of people have gone to this town or park since this incident occurred. For a long time it wasn't safe to set foot within a set radius of the blast. Those who have been brave or foolish enough to set foot into this town and explore the amusement park have reported some strange and scary findings. Rumor has it that some sort of entity lives there. Something dark and evil calling this abandoned place home. A nasty and sinister entity that doesn't like to be disturbed. There have been talks of this being some type of shadow creature or potentially a beast like a werewolf of sorts. Either way, the people who visit this place feel an overwhelming sense of dread when they're there. They also feel as if they're unwelcome, like they entered somebody's home who doesn't want them there. There are multiple reasons why this amusement park is abandoned, so I'd stay away if I was you. And finally, number one on this list is Six Flags. Now I don't mean Six Flags as a chain or anything like that. There's 23 different Six Flags in the United States and not all of them are haunted. One in particular though is currently out of commission, abandoned, and definitely a spot you shouldn't go to. All the rooms writes, this Six Flags fell out of business following serious damage from Hurricane Katrina in 2005. The park opened in 2000 and was only operating for a few years before suffering significantly during the hurricane which displaced 20,000 people and killed nearly 2,000 people. The park closed after Hurricane Katrina and there wasn't enough funding for repair so it fell into further decay over the last few years. To this day, there's still an eerie sign at the entrance of the park that says closed for the storm. It's an apocalyptic site which has been taken advantage of by Hollywood and used for films such as Jurassic World and Dawn of Planet of the Apes. These filmmakers are way braver than I would be because I would not want to be setting foot on those grounds. The people who have been here all seem to think that something paranormal is going on. Phantom noises echoing throughout the park and other random bodiless sounds are heard all the time. Similarly to a lot of the other things on this list, there is a massive overhanging feeling of dread. The air is thick with it and you can almost taste the discomfort. No one has reported being attacked here, but it seems like that's only a matter of time if people keep going. The mayor of New Orleans is currently looking at demolishing this park, which in my opinion, Probably for the best. Number five, lipstick warning. Now, Stella McDonald and her now ex husband used to love exploring abandoned structures when they were together. I remembered one that they described as a shack that was about a mile away from their home. To set the scene, the grass and trees were so grown over and tall that it was hard even getting to said house. Her ex managed to get a window open though, and that's how they got in because, you know, the doors were completely awful. Mildew, you name it. Blech. I think this is where I interject a warning to not do this yourself, don't do this at home, and if you ever feel the need to urban explore, for the love of everything, please do it safe. So Stella described what they found as a time capsule, with piles of expensive furniture and stuff covered with really dusty sheets. Apparently though, everything looked really high quality and expensive, like even the wallpaper was nice. It was creepy how it seemed like the former residents just walked away from all of it in the 1950s or 60s, and how awful the exterior seemed in comparison. Once again, she called it a shack, not me. So the kitchen was upstairs, which was pretty odd, but you know, the duo ventured up there and then there's this huge arch opening into like a gentleman's type man cave. Stella made a note that once again, there was a plethora of expensive furniture furniture and who knows what else. So she stood in the archway while her ex rummaged through all of the unknown clutter. Now off to the side of the arch was a huge mirror leaning against the wall. So she used it, she wanted to like check her hair, make sure there was no spider webs in it. Honestly just the thought of that makes me want to take a shower. No thank you. Stella took maybe three steps away from the mirror to tell her ex that she wanted to leave because it felt like there was a presence right beside her. And when she returned in front of the mirror she saw that the words get out were suddenly scrawled out in bright pink lipstick that uh, very much hadn't been there before. Now she's sworn on everything that it hadn't been there. She would have noticed it and also would have noticed if there was 
another presence in the room with her and her husband. So this shot caused Stella to scream, leap back into a kitchen table, and then obviously, you know, crash, kaboom, fall. So her ex came running over, cause you know, this got his attention, but Stella was too scared to form words by this point. So she just continued to point at the mirror and babble until the duo safely got away. Yeah, hard pass. Also congrats on him being your ex. It's not like he cared for you in this moment though. Number four, death becomes you. So yeah, this uh, there was this once beautiful Greek revival home in Uniontown, Alabama, but now apparently it looks like it's being swallowed up by the earth, and it's tragic past certainly lives up to the haunting aesthetic. Look folks, the term shack is subjective, and I'm about to stretch that meaning beyond its limit today. So in January of 1994, the remains of, um, let's see if I can get this right, bleep year old Alan Lucy were found buried beneath the front porch of the Hardy Coleman house, or as it's better known, you know, online, the Lucy M-U-R-D-E-R house. So Alan, who lived in the home with his adoptive parents, Philip and Margaret Lucy, disappeared without a trace in May of 1985. In the months that followed, Jason Lucy, you know, their biological son, told classmates that his father killed Alan and married him in the backyard. For years, nobody believed Jason's story, even though rumors about the Lucy family swirled around town long before Alan disappeared. Decades after, you know, Alan Lucy's killer was brought to justice, the house has still not recovered, largely due to environmental injustices that have driven many residents out of Uniontown and left those who remain fighting for justice of their own. So what's left? Well, you know, nothing crazy, just a house in the middle of a forest. Haunted beyond belief. Mm. Lots of bad mojo there. Number three, a hiking adventure gone wrong. So this tale comes along courtesy of Grant Charbonneau, who along with his buddy Mike embarked on a hiking adventure on the day after he turned 18. So armed with a compass to navigate the labyrinth of trails, the duo set out to conquer the longest route leading to a camping spot deep within the forest. The color-coded paths ensured they stayed on course, but fate had other plans for the friends. As they ventured along the red route adorned with a tent emblem, a dilapidated sign hinted at an old dirt road, tempting them to deviate from their original plan. Intrigued by the mystery it promised, they forged ahead, discovering an abandoned domicile, you know, discovering an abandoned place concealed by Nietzsche's, you know, reclaiming of it. A desolate structure covered in graffiti and bearing ominous signs of warning. Let's just see, what did it have? Oh right, the classic, keep out, private property, and trespassers will be, you know, kaboomed, for lack of a better word. Undeterred by the foreboding messages, the boys breached the door's defenses, revealing a time forgotten interior frozen in the mid 1980s. Dust covered relics, wild boar and stag heads adorning the walls, painted a picture of abandonment and eerie stillness. Now their curiosity pushed them further. Mike ascended upstairs while Grant explored the kitchen. The disconcerting ambiance heightened as they stumbled upon a locked door beneath the stairs. Now, this is where I personally would be running for the hills, because if something is locked, it should probably stay that way, but I'm sure you and I can both guess how this story is about to go, otherwise I wouldn't be mentioning it. Determined, the boys broke the chains and uncovered a hidden staircase leading to a basement. And not just any basement, one harboring a bizarre secret. So their flashlights illuminated a room filled with glass cases, each veiled in layers of dust. As they wiped away the grime, they were met with grotesque wax like figures clad in various dresses. Now finally, we've got a chill running down their spines, but oh, just wait, wait till we get to the center case. There, suspended in eternal bondage, was a clothed human figure, a haunting display of the macabre. A yellow stained envelope nearby contained a handwritten note, revealing the twisted mind behind this morbid collection. The author, a self-proclaimed collector, detailed a dark journey from taxidermist to a connoisseur of preserved human beauty. Is words not mine. Each victim, immortalized in wax, became a macabre masterpiece in this gruesome gallery. Overwhelmed by a revulsion, the boys finally made their escape, leaving the forest and its secrets behind. The note, a testament to the deranged mind that lurked in the shadows, became their only link to a truth that the authorities struggled to unravel. Now, as the guys sat in the safety of Grant's car, the weight of what they witnessed began to sink in. So this forest, once a realm of adventure, kind of now bore the stain of unspeakable horrors. And the abandoned house stood as a silent witness to the uh, awfulness within. Sorry, I was losing my words there because, like, how on earth do you describe that? The echoes of that day linger in the you know depths of their memories. A chilling reminder that, uh, you know, maybe don't adventure where you're not supposed to go. Seriously, folks, beware. Number two, captive room. Did you seriously think I was going to do a whole list on abandoned places that would terrify authorities without having a single story from actual authorities? Come on, folks. How do you take me for? I like my credible sources, and this one just happens to hit a little close to home. Oh, how close, you ask? Well, as an Ontario resident, a story that took place in Pickering seems pretty close enough. So back in 2011, on, you know, December 19th to be exact, Durham police reported that they'd found what appeared to be a confinement room in an old abandoned farmhouse east of Toronto. Police said the room in the Northwest Pickering home was recently built and looked like it was solely designed to hold someone captive. Now investigators at the time were trying to figure out if the room was used to actually confine somebody or if it was just designed for another purpose and they were, you know, over exaggerating. So they mentioned like one possibility is that it might have been built as a prop 
for an amateur filmmaker. So this room was stumbled upon by contractors surveying the property because you know it was slated for demolition more than two weeks prior to the report. At the time, Durham Police spokesman Dave Selby said uh, that the home had been abandoned for so long that the focus wasn't on the original owners, but on anyone who may have been seen driving in the area or any other suspicious activity. They're obviously down there because it's somewhere where no one would check. They're obviously down there because it's somewhere where no one would check. You could stick someone in this room and lock them in. Now police didn't rule anything out, but they weren't able to determine at the time if anybody was ever held in the room. Once again, we've got our cop spokesman. Our forensic guys went down and took all kinds of samples of anything they could, you know, find to figure out if it was used and how it was used. But at this point, it's still under investigation, and we really don't know if it was used for a criminal purpose or not. So two weeks after the room was discovered, the farmhouse burned down in what police described as a suspicious fire. Now they've never laid charges in connection to the fire, but you know, Robert White was eventually charged, arrested, and pleaded guilty to breaking and entering with intent. He planned on kidnapping a woman named Gwen Armstrong, a friend of his ex-wife's, because she provided her with emotional because she provided his ex-wife with emotional and financial support after their separation. Yikes! Number one, somebody found a body. A group of young adults in South Carolina back in 2021 got quite the scare when they were exploring an allegedly haunted house and wound up discovering a dead body in a freezer. According to a local media report, the strange incident occurred in the town of Norway as eight youngsters were riding ATVs in a remote part of the community. So at some point in the midst of their adventure, they came upon an abandoned shack, which is rumored to be, you know, haunted. And as adventurous folks are, you know, likely to do, they were like, hey, let's go see if there's any ghosts inside. However, as they were looking around the vacant residents, one of the members of the group stumbled upon a sizable freezer and decided, let's see what's inside. Upon opening the cold storage unit, he was greeted by an ungodly smell, which he initially thought was just, you know, rotting meat. Like technically he was right, although the contents of the freezer were far more gruesome than, you know, although the contents of the freezer were far more gruesome than, you know, some old pork chops. That's because on closer examination, he realized that the meat was wearing jeans and socks. So the would-be ghost hunters called the cops, who arrived on the scene to collect the body for an autopsy to figure out the identity of the deceased. It is believed that the body inside the freezer had been there for months and could possibly be the victim of foul play. As for the adventurous youngins, it would seem that they are now haunted by something far more unsettling than a ghost, the stench from the rotting corpse. One of them said, I heard that once you smell a human, you can't ever forget it. And he's like, yeah, I can still smell it right now. In fifth place, we have Nocton Hall Hospital. So it was built in 1530 and originally meant for residential use, but served as a hospital for American officers who were injured in World War I. It was used once more as a military hospital during World War II and has been used in a similar capacity ever since but no more. In the 1980s, it was once again put to private use, but by the 1990s, a significant fire had rendered it unhabitable. Time for the dark stuff. It's alleged that one of the male owners of the home sexually took advantage of and uh, killed a young girl. Today, her presence has been reported by various people who were in the building. Many people claim to have seen the ghostly image appearing at exactly 4.30 a.m. since she's fond of standing at the end of staff members' beds in the middle of the night. Interesting that she chooses the 4 a.m. hour to appear, since 3 a.m. is usually the like preferred time for spirits, since that's when the veil between our world and theirs is the thinnest. So this spirit has been blamed for the disembodied sound of sobbing around the building. The building is also said to have a resident gray lady, but information around her is a lot harder to find, so let me know in the comments if, you know, there's any experts out there, because any ghosty with a missing story is super intriguing to me. In fourth place, we have the Trenton State Hospital, originally known as the New Jersey State Lunatic Asylum, later Trenton State, and now Trenton Psychiatric Hospital. It was the very first one founded on the Kirkbride Plan by activist Dorothea Dix, but is more remembered for, you know, its medical no-nos instead of its well-intentioned beginnings. Dr. Henry Cotton became the director of the hospital in 1907 and instituted treatments based on his own theories of mental illness. On the one hand, Henry, who had trained at John Hopkins under the eminent Swiss-born psychiatrist Adolf Mayer had a very progressive attitude towards care for his patients. He did away with the mechanical restraints that so many other hospitals used to control patients, introduced occupational therapy, increased the staff, and ensured that the nurses would prevent violence against the patients, and instituted daily staff meetings about patient care. But Henry developed a dangerous theory about mental illness, one that turned his hospital into a house of horrors. After it was confirmed in 1913 that the spirochate that caused syphilis can cause the disease's psychiatric symptoms, Henry began to suspect that all mental illness was caused by bodily infections, and that the only way to cure the patient was to remove the offending infection. In 1917, he began removing his patient's teeth, even in cases where x-rays showed no evidence of infection. Ow! He soon moved on to the other body parts, gallbladder, stomachs, ovaries, testicles, tracts of colon, 
uteruses. Henry claimed a cure rate of 85%, but in reality, his surgeries had an unconsciously high mortality rate. And he didn't always obtain consent from the patients or their family members. And in fact, sometimes performed these removals despite their protests. And hey, if that isn't icky enough, he wasn't quiet at all about what he was doing. The crazy doctor published papers and gave presentations on his work. When Mayer, Henry's mentor, sent you know another psychiatrist to report on the operations at Trenton State, he initially suppressed the report, allowing Henry to continue his gruesome work. He remained at Trenton until 1930, three years before his death. Now the tooth pulling practice remained in place until 1960, and my mouth hurts thinking about it. Before I get nightmares. Time to move on to the fun stuff. As for the ghosts themselves, they are thought to all be those of patients that died within the building. But the most well-known ghost is that of Dr. Henry himself, who has been seen wearing a white doctor's coat and walking down the corridor in the area outside his office. The most commonly reported phenomenon at the hospital is that of disembodied voices, mainly muffled screams and moans coming from distant rooms. Orbs can be caught throughout the building at any time of the day, with some having a strong pale blue glow to them. There are also tales of seeing the ghosts of patients with arms and legs missing, who have been seen in some of the rooms upon, you know, Somebody entering them, only to fade away after a few seconds. See, the ghost of patients I'd love to see, but I feel like seeing Henry would terrify me for a while now that I know, you know, what he did in his lifetime. A lovely example of why to not enable people who do bad things. In third place, we have the London Asylum for the Insane. So in 1870, London introduced its first asylum, and as one of the first institutions to treat mental illness in Ontario, Canada, it was, um, revolutionary. Hey, within days, their 500 beds were full. So it was located just outside of the city center, and the asylum initially focused on compassionate care and moral therapy. Their intent was to treat the patient as a whole being, rather than, you know, focusing on a single symptom. Patients would be bettered as members of society, fitting in with the community by keeping steady jobs and following strict social norms, thus, um, curing their mental illnesses. Now, while conforming to the ideals of conservative society sounds horrid to me, I do understand that at the time, it was probably a safe move. The world is a lot more forgiving now of individuality and understanding of differences, even though we still have a long way to go. So doctors at the asylum also performed several um, experimental surgeries. In fact, Dr. Richard Maurice Buck, who believed you know failed reproductive organs to be the source of mental illness or hysteria in women, executed routine hysterectomies. Moving into the 1930s, shock therapy was introduced to treat symptoms of schizophrenia by inducing seizures. Lobotomies were also completed between 1944 and 1967. While we don't know how many were performed in you know, London specifically, there are about a thousand between these 23 years across Ontario. One reason that someone would be sent to the asylum includes sexual deviation. What is, you know, shockingly expectant is that body self-love was identified as the root cause of a majority of mental illnesses. So Dr. Buck thought he had remedied this self-harm by inserting a metal wire into the foreskin of a man's penis so that the act would be too painful and uncomfortable. So what this doctor did not know is, you know, that self-love is actually a positive action for sexual health and is not the cause of mental illness, as he would later discover after 11 failed attempts of reversing what he did. What am I forgetting? I feel like there's something I haven't mentioned yet. Oh, right. Ghosts. There was a tree at the main door which was dead and black in color while vegetation was growing all around it, and uh, oh, that was the tree that patients ended their lives from. The chapel is known to be haunted, with the temperature inside always feeling ice cold, even though it might be sweltering hot outdoors, and the recreation building has also been known to be the home of many unknown ghosts. But the one ghost you want to avoid is that of the bad doctor himself, who passed away on the grounds in February of 1902 when he paused to gaze at the stars one winter's night and lost his balance, and you know, died from the resulting head injury. It's alleged that he was pushed by the ghost of one of his patients who had died from his morbid experimentation, but um, sadly the mortality rate, like I mentioned before, was so high that um, we don't know which patient it was. In second place we have the Topeka State Hospital. So according to the Topeka Capital Journal, a reporter visited the facility at some point during the early 20th century and saw a patient who had been strapped down for so long that his skin had begun to grow over his restraints. So according to my research, this would take many months, if not years to do so. So I am shuddering. Other patients were chained up well naked for months at a time. For many residents at that time, however, life offered a uh, different, similar sort of hell, even if they were unrestrained and unending boredom. Patients were given nothing to do, nothing to stimulate their minds, and so they sat in rocking chairs in the hallway all day, rocking and staring and doing nothing else. Thankfully, in 1948, Kansas Governor Frank Carlson, responding to you know, reports of overcrowding and deplorable conditions, convened a panel to, you know, Study the problem. The state legislature ended up doubling the appropriations for mental hospitals, and the rocking chairs were removed from the hallway. However, the hospital lost its Medicare and Medicaid accreditation in 1988, and like so many hospitals, lost patients to community-based programs during the 1990s. In 1997, the year I was born, the hospital closed its doors for good. The ghosts that wander what's left of the hospital are those of former patients, which I know, I'm sounding like a broken record. 
Oh, there's a cemetery on the hospital grounds, which is, you know, the final resting place of patients who died in the hospital. Only 16 of the 1,157 graves have headstones, and most of the souls are left nameless. Visitors to the hospital grounds report seeing orbs and hearing strange moans coming from the cemetery. Yeah, no thank you. In first place, we have Century Manor. So built in 1884 on the outskirts of Hamilton, Ontario, Century Manor was the second major structural component of the Hamilton Asylum for the Insane, an institution initially established for the treatment of alcoholics. Newspaper articles published in the late 19th and early 20th centuries documented at least nine self-deaths committed in the building, as well as several attempts made by inmates who uh, escaped the hospital. Century Manor was also the scene of several strange accidents and horrific crimes. One female patient fell to her death while attempting to, you know, escape out a window using a rope made from bed sheets, while another had her skull crushed by a falling elevator. One particularly troublesome male inmate was allegedly slugged to death by orderlies, while another split open the head of the asylum's head baker with an axe. No biggie, right? Apparently the living conditions were so bad that in 1910, a former inmate wrote a letter to the Legislative Assembly of Ontario, saying that the place was an outrage to civilization. Let me... Allow me to read what he said. Wretched, vile torment is the order of the institutions. He had seen patients pounded, choked, insensible, time and time again, until redness would run from their nostrils. Oh, I haven't even gotten to the most dramatic tale yet. In the early morning hours of August 11th on 1911, a fire mysteriously broke out on the building's top floor. Firefighters who battled the blaze said that three of the inmates they rescued from the burning building broke away from them and leapt back into the inferno. When the embers finally cooled, firefighters found eight bodies amongst the ashes, including a paralytic who had burned to death in his cell, as well as five men huddled together in a small room. Burnt to a crisp. Now, the historic building shut its doors for good in 1995 and has sat empty ever since, serving as a haunting reminder of Hamilton's dark and tragic history. And now that we've got the history out of the way, time to talk about the ghosties. My favorite part. Underneath the property of Century Manor lies a system of old tunnels. This first-hand account comes from Jeff Cooper, who was hired to guard the entire West Fifth property overnight, and on one particular evening, he was making his rounds and ended up underground and inside the tunnels. He made a turn at one of the corners and found himself lost in a hallway with just one wooden door at the end. He heard voices coming from the other side of the door, so he walked up to it, quickly braced himself, took a few deep breaths, and swung the door open. There, sitting at a table in the middle of a small, dirty old room, were two women, dressed in old-fashioned nurse's uniforms. They both slowly turned and stared at him directly in the eye, until one of them spoke up and calmly said to the other, See? I told you he'd find us. The security guard was so frightened that he backed out of the room, slammed the door behind him, and caught his breath. He gathered his nerves a second time and slowly opened the door to a completely empty room. The nurses had disappeared from the room, with no other exits being apparent or visible. The ghosts of the men who lost their lives in the fire are also known to roam what's left of the establishment, so if any urban explorers smell smoke while they're there, don't say I didn't warn ya. Number 5. Union Graveyard This specific cemetery is located near Stepney Road in Easton, Connecticut, and dates back to the 1700s. According to Ghost Hunters, it is one of the most haunted cemeteries in the entire United States. The most popular ghostie is the elusive white lady, popularized partially thanks to Ed Warren having an obsession with her and possibly catching footage of her. Some believe she is Harriet Seeley, whose young son passed shortly after being born, and Harriet herself passing soon after. Legend believes she may have died in hopes of finding her son, and still wanders their final resting place searching him out. Others believe she is the ghost of a woman from the 1940s who killed her husband, and later herself, and is doomed to wander the graveyard. Her physical description is the one thing that remains consistent. She is a young woman wearing a white dress with dark hair. It seems as if she enjoys scaring the daylights out of the living, so my kind of gal. Many who have witnessed her believe they have almost hit her with their vehicle, only to find no trace of her once they pull over. Others claim they have often seen her hovering slightly above the ground around the cemetery, going back and forth amongst different gravestones. In 1993, local firefighter Glenn Powell received a call about a transformer explosion and drove to the scene of the incident with a police officer and observed a female driver following closely behind him on the road. He remembers the night sky had turned pink, and the explosion emitted large amounts of electricity that made the hair on his arms stand up at uh, quite the distance. Glenn was driving along the road beside the cemetery when the officer seated next to him yelled, Watch out! In the middle of the road was a woman with long brown flowing hair and wearing a white Victorian nightgown. Glenn described seeing a surprised look on her face before slamming on the brake, but was unable to avoid hitting her, describing it like hitting a brick wall with the back of his truck flying into the air and the policeman next to him being launched into the dashboard. The driver behind him jumped out of the car and helped the two men search the area of the crash to check on the woman, but she was gone. Glenn is quoted as saying there was no sign of bodily fluids, there was no clothing, there was nobody, there was nothing. Now, Lorraine Warren used to often take walks through the cemetery, saying that it was one of the most haunted places around. Ed caught the white lady 
on camera on September 1st of 1990 at 2.40 a.m., which was his seventh night in a row of filming at the cemetery. Determined to have proof, and described dark figures surrounding her, shapes that he thought were wood ghosts that seemed to jump on her while they all argued. Now, the warrants have also referenced a red eyes ghost, so a pair of red eyes which they claimed can be seen in the forest behind the cemetery, not to be confused with bike reflectors that locals have placed within the grounds to scare teens. The famous duo claimed the eyes belonged to Earl Kellogg, a man who was set on fire across the street in 1935. Number 4. Highgate Cemetery Highgate Cemetery is located in North London, England, and was assigned by architect Stephen Geary. There are approximately 170,000 people buried in around 53,000 graves across the West and East cemeteries for context. And Today's tale has to do with vampires. In 1967, two teenage girls were walking home along the nearby Swains Lane and claimed to have witnessed the dead rising from their graves by the cemetery's north gate. Another teenager had been awoken one night with something cold and clinging on her hand, which left prominent marks the next morning. While reports circulated of a tall man in a hat walking in the area before melting through the cemetery's walls. On Halloween night of 1968, a group of teenagers interested in the occult visited Tottenham Park Cemetery, at a time when it was being regularly vandalized by intruders. According to a report in the London Evening News on November 2nd, the teens arranged flowers taken from graves in circular patterns with arrows of blooms pointing to a new grave, which was uncovered. And by that I mean a coffin was opened and the body inside was uh, disturbed. But their most macabre act was driving an iron stake in the form of a cross through the lid and into the chest of the corpse. In a letter to the Hampstead and Highgate Express on February 6th of 1970, David Ferrant wrote that when passing Highgate Cemetery on Christmas Eve of 1969, he had glimpsed a gray figure, which he considered to be supernatural, and asked if others had seen anything similar. Sean Manchester claimed David's gray figure was a vampire, and the media quickly latched on, embellishing the tale with stories of the vampire being a king of the vampires or practicing black magic. See, king of the vampires? That's my kind of guy. A rivalry grew between David and Sean, with each claiming that he could and would expel or destroy the specter. Sean declared that he would hold an exorcism on Friday the 13th of March, which, you know, it's a good spooky date for that uh, sort of thing. ITV conducted interviews with both men, and others who claimed to have seen supernatural figures in the cemetery, which were transmitted early on the evening of the 13th, and within two hours, a mob of hunters from all over London and beyond had swarmed over the gates and walls into the locked cemetery, despite police efforts to get them the heck out of there. Some months later, on August 1st of 1970, the charred and headless remains of a woman's body were found not far from the catacomb, believed to have been used in a black magic ritual. David was found by police in the churchyard beside the cemetery one night in August, carrying a crucifix and a wooden stake. He was arrested, but when the case came to court, it was dismissed. There was more publicity about David and Sean when rumors spread that they would meet in a magician's duel on Parliament Hill on Friday the 13th of April in 1973, which never occurred. The vampire is said to lurk until this day, so maybe I'll have to make a trip eventually to um, pay my respects if you get what I mean. Number 3. Hollywood Forever The Hollywood Forever Cemetery is one of the oldest in the state of California and is located on Santa Monica Boulevard. Many famous individuals are buried in the cemetery, such as Rudolph Valentino, Mickey Rooney, Anton Yelchin, and Judy Garland. First used in 1899, it features well over 50 acres of land for families and visitors. There are still thousands of spaces available and new mausoleums being completed, but it's time to talk about the ghosties. It should also be noted that Paramount Studios is located near the cemetery and it is said to be one of the most haunted movie studios of all time, so let me know if y'all want me to uh, ever elaborate on that. I'll start with the obvious, and I think the most dedicated fan ever, the woman in black. Also, yes, my bias for unknown ghostly ladies, you know, known only by their outfits, is coming into play. This is why I choose to always dress up, because I'd personally hate for my last outfit to be my raggedy PJs. What do you think? Would uh, this be a good final resting outfit? If not, I'm open to suggestions. Rudolph had passed away at the age of 31 in 1926 after surgery from an ulcer, and over 100,000 people gathered outside the funeral home. Fun fact, there were rumors that a wax replica was used to protect the body at the service. He was quite the popular heartthrob at the time. Heck, I'm racking my brain for like a modern day equivalent, and I'm failing. Just imagine your celebrity crush, but everyone also liked that same crush to a crazy level. It wasn't until after he had been laid to rest that the woman in black began to appear, and mainly she likes to come out on the anniversary of his death, dressed from head to toe in black, including a veil. She would leave roses on the grave and was originally thought to be Pola Negri, the woman he was engaged to during the time of his death, but nope. Many women have come forward claiming they are the woman in black. However, none of these claims have turned out to be true. Alrighty, ghosty number two, Miss Virginia Rappi. 
On Labor Day in 1921, Virginia had attended a party for a Mr. Roscoe Arbuckle at the St. Francis Hotel, which was held to celebrate acquiring a very large contract. Sadly, at that very party, Virginia had become sick and mysteriously passed a few days later at only 26 years old. Now, many claims were made surrounding her death, including the possibility of Arbuckle taking sexual advantage of her, a claim that was later proven false but sadly had negatively affected his career. No one knows exactly what happened to her on that fateful Labor Day. Around the site of Virginia's grave, folks have reported the temperature dropping to an icy cold climate and have also heard what appears to be sobbing. Many believe that she is still dealing with this traumatic event, with many visitors clearly seeing her weeping on the edge of water that is located on the grounds. I'm sure there are plenty of other ghosties, so let me know if anyone knows of any that I might have forgotten. Number 2. Resurrection Cemetery Located in Chicago, this cemetery is the home of a very well-known ghostie, Resurrection Mary, who is also commonly referred to as B-L-O-O-D-Y Mary, blame the interwebs for the spelling out, has different origins, depending on who's telling the story, but the most shared narratives put her on timely death sometime in the late 1920s to early 1930s, when she was either a victim of a fatal car crash on the way to a night of dancing, or the unfortunate victim of a hit and run accident while she was walking home in the rain. Most documented reports of Mary describe her as a young, fashionable blonde woman, no older than mid-twenties, wearing a white ball gown, accessories, and a hairstyle to match. The first person who claimed to encounter Resurrection Mary was a man named Jerry Pallas. In 1939, Jerry was at a popular dance hall when he was love struck by a young blonde woman. He approached her and the two hit it off and spent the night dancing away, even sharing a scandalous kiss. According to Jerry, her hands were as cold as ice, but he had a warm heart that made up for it. So, you know, eventually, closing time came around and Jerry offered the woman a ride home, and she asked to be taken down Archer Avenue. She motioned for Jerry to stop in front of the Resurrection Cemetery, and when he did, she got out and vanished before his eyes. Jerry was shaken with disbelief, but not too frightened to seek out answers. The next morning, he made his way to the address where Mary said she lived, over in Southside. He knocked on the door and encountered her mother. Now, when Jerry asked about the woman he had met the previous night, she informed him that she'd been dead for nearly three years. It turned out that, yep, Jerry had encountered Resurrection Mary, and over the next few decades, several other men would have similar experiences. But that was the one that began the legend. One cab driver in the 1970s claimed to see a young woman standing in front of the Resurrection Cemetery one night, and he pulled over to check to see if she needed a ride. And as the woman approached the vehicle, Yep, she disappeared. Another encounter with Mary occurred in 1979 when a separate cab driver named Ralph claimed to pick up a young female hitchhiker he believed to be no older than 21. As the two drove up Archer Avenue, she suddenly jumped up and said, Here! Here! The car came to a sudden stop and the woman pointed to a small abandoned shack off of the left side of the road. Now, Ralph questioned whether this was actually where she wanted to go, but before he got an answer, she disappeared without ever opening the door of his cab. His encounter was detailed in a 1979 issue of Suburban Trip magazine. And in 1980, Claire Rudnicki and her husband Mark were driving down Archer Avenue towards the cemetery when they spotted a young woman in a white gown slowly walking down the side of the road. Now, it was immediately obvious that she wasn't an ordinary person as she was partially transparent with a white aura around her, almost as if she was glowing. Shocked, the couple wondered if they had just seen a ghost, and when they once again reached the spot where Mary was walking, you guessed it, she was gone. Mary is supposedly buried at this cemetery in Justice, Illinois, about a 30 minute drive southwest of Chicago, and it gives her her stomping grounds as well as her iconic name. She likes to stick to that particular stretch of road on Archer Avenue, between the cemetery and what was once the O. Henry Ballroom in Willow Springs. Over the years, several researchers have tried to determine the exact identity of Mary, but no one knows. Due to the number of sightings and the credibility of those who claim to see her, Resurrection Mary is said to be one of Chicago's most famous ghosts. Number 1. Stull Cemetery Stull Cemetery and the abandoned church that rests next to it is located in the tiny, nearly forgotten Kansas town of Stull. Oh, and it's believed to be one of the seven portals to hell. So counted among the most haunted cemeteries in the world, Stull Cemetery has gained a haunted reputation due to a legend that involves Satan. The legends say that these stories have been linked to Stull for more than 100 years, but none of them made it into print until the 1970s. Specifically, in November of 1974, an article appeared in the University of Kansas student newspaper that spoke of a number of strange occurrences in the Stull churchyard. According to the article, Stull was haunted by legends of diabolical, supernatural happenings, and the legends claimed that the cemetery was one of the two places on Earth where the devil appears in person two times each year. Apparently, most students learned of Stull's diabolical reputation from their grandparents or, you know, other older individuals, but that many of them claimed first-hand encounters with things that could not be explained. One student claimed to have been grabbed by the arm by something unseen, while others spoke of unexplained memory loss when visiting the place. The legends also say that the devil has been appearing here since the 1850s, and insist 
realized that the original name of the town was Skull, and that the later corruption into that of Stahl was simply to cover the fact that the area was steeped in black magic. Number 5 on this list is Mary King's Close. Mary King's Close is known to most as being Scotland's most haunted street. It's a very dark and mysterious looking street. I'm not sure if we have any Harry Potter fans watching, but it reminds me of the dark part of Diagon Alley. Just really strong and creepy vibes. It leads off of Edinburgh's Royal Mile, which is the road coming from Edinburgh Castle. This close was apparently gated off in the past during an outbreak of the plague and was left like this for a long time. Only pretty recently has it been reopened, but ever since it has, the reports of hauntings have run rampant. The most commonly spotted spirit here is that of a young girl. Nobody knows her name or why she's there, but she'll often appear holding a little plush bunny rabbit and run through the close. She's said to be devilishly tricky as well and will often steal tiny things off of your person as you pass by without even realizing. Phones, wallets, rings, necklaces, tiny things of this nature are often reported being lost or stolen after walking through the clothes. Some people think that when this place got bricked up, she was actually forgotten about in here and then died. I'm not sure how someone could possibly have forgotten a little girl here as they were locking it up, but I suppose anything is possible. Either way, it is deeply haunted now, and if you do go, then make sure you leave all your valuables at home. Number 4 on this list is Stirling Castle. Stirling Castle is one of the most haunted castles in all of Scotland's history and is located on top of Castle Hill. Great Castles writes, The most famous spirit to call Stirling Castle home is the ghost of the Green Lady. Stirling Castle still serves as the home to a garrison, and one evening she delayed dinner in the officer's mess when she materialized behind the chef who was preparing the meal for the soldiers. Feeling as though he was being watched, he turned around, only to see her green, translucent form standing behind him, at which time he fainted. She simply vanished on this occasion, but her appearances are usually a harbinger of bad things to come. On several occasions, her visits have occurred shortly before fires or other mishaps at the castle. The ghost of a pink lady sometimes can be seen leaving the castle and walking to the neighboring church of the Holy Rood Ladies Rock. This was an elevated location where the ladies of the court would go to watch knights participate in jousting tournaments. Some believe the Pink Lady is the ghost of the sole survivor of Edward I's siege of the castle in 1304. Having escaped the siege, she keeps returning to the castle to find her slain husband, though her spirit is seen leaving the castle, not entering. This article then goes on to talk about a ghost of a man with a kilt who lives around the dungeons of this castle and occasionally shows himself to the visitors. But clearly the spirits of this castle are pretty fond of bright colors. The green lady, the pink lady, I'm kind of surprised that we didn't get a few more ghosts together and we can make a whole freaking rainbow. Even though they are bright and colorful, they are still very scary. In fact, there have been reports of people actually dying of sheer fright before, their corpses looking as if they were petrified to death. It's also believed that if you don't die of fright, then seeing these ghosts is a sign of horrible things to come. Either way, I would recommend avoiding this spot altogether. Scotland has a bunch of other non-haunted castles to visit if you need to get your castle fix in. Number 3 on this list is the Culloden Moor. The Culloden Moor acted as the site for one of Scotland's most infamous and bloody battles in all of history. Christy McIntyre writes, Many of the ancient battlefields of Scotland are rumored to be plagued by the souls of those who died there. It's not surprising that Culloden, the site one of the most infamous battles in British history, is among them. Over and under an hour, nearly 1,500 Jacobite soldiers were killed, and it remains the last battle fought on British soil. But according to some locals, the battle still rages. Gunfire, swords, and crying are set to echo across the empty moor, particularly on the anniversary of the battle. As well as sounds of combat, the figure of a lone Jacobite soldier reportedly roams the battlefield wandering in his clan tartan, muttering defeated over and over again as he goes. He's not the only ghostly visitor to this site. Close to the battlefield is the house that Bonnie Prince Charlie, leader of the Jacobite rebellion, slept in the night before the battle. Although now a hotel, it's said that the prince still lingers there wearing full highland dress, waiting for the battle that will restore him to the throne. Birds are said to never sing or even fly over this area since they can sense the horrible spirits that are still around here. Whenever birds or animals in general want to avoid a certain area, usually it makes me pretty skeptical as well. 
Animals have a sixth sense about such things and they can feel danger before it's even there. Also, if I'm to avoid any ghosts, then it's always going to be the ones that were slain in battle. These souls have been through hell and are obviously very dangerous. Our soldier could wander around saying defeated, or he could pull out his ghost sword and go to town on you. Not a risk that I am personally willing to take. Number two on this list is Overton Bridge. I'm sorry, but this bridge is clearly haunted is actually the title of an article written by Amanda Arnold on how freaking haunted this bridge actually is. The bridge is located in the small Scottish town of Dumbarton. Most bridges that we talk about on this channel are haunted by the ghosts of those who have passed away here or some lady in white that longs for her lover here or something like that. Not this one though. This bridge actually isn't dangerous at all to humans. It is however super dangerous to our best friends. Dogs. Apparently this one little bridge in basically the middle of nowhere has been the host to over 50 dogs taking their own life. Yeah, you heard that properly, a dog taking their own life. In the past 60 years, anywhere from 300 to 600 dogs have thrown themselves over the bridge for no apparent reason and over 50 of them have died from the fall. Think about that statistic for a second. Like, that's actually kind of crazy. Outsiders believe that there has to be some kind of smell or some property around here that attracts the dogs to the water, but locals believe it's something paranormal. Apparently, even though these spirits are not dangerous to humans, we can still sense them, and people around here have sensed these beings before. It also doesn't seem like a smell that bothers these dogs because they go into a deep trance right before they leap off. At first, she froze, McKinnon told the times, but then she became possessed by a strange energy and ran and jumped right off the parapet. That was a statement from a dog owner who watched as their dog jumped off the bridge. Locals think that the ghost who is causing these doggy disturbances are from the Lady of Overton. She died here many years ago mourning her husband. I suppose this could be the case, but why is she taking out her grief on dogs? Like, come on lady, let's leave the pups out of this. Anyways, this is definitely a haunted spot, and if you do happen to be walking your dog here, then keep it on a leash. Number one on this list is Cawdor Castle. Cawdor Castle is definitely one of the most haunted castles in Europe. It is quite a name for itself because it has a strong connection to one of the most successful stories ever written, Macbeth. This also adds to the lore of this castle's haunting because Macbeth, or the Scottish play, has its own history of haunting surrounding it. Even though this castle is deeply tied in with that story, its haunting doesn't share any connection to the one that plagues Macbeth. This one is centered around the ghost of a woman named Muriel Calder. Muriel Calder was the daughter of the Earl of Calder who was in charge of the castle in the 18th century. Her ghost is seen at this castle all the time with most of the sightings taking place in the tallest tower here. There are two stories of origin for how she managed to come about and no one is 100% sure which is the correct one. The first story talks about how she fell in love with someone from a rival clan. A real Romeo and Juliet story where she was deeply in love with someone that she wasn't allowed to see. She would sneak out to see this boy but eventually her father caught her and punished her for her actions. After learning of her treachery, his rage knew no bounds and he beat his daughter. She got away though and ran to the top of the tower, locking the door behind her. Her father wasn't deterred though and broke through, drawing his sword in the process. She tried climbing out the window to safety, but her dad, with one big swing, cut both of her hands off and she fell to her death. The second story doesn't include the dramatic chase up to the tower, but says that he just cut her hands off as punishment so that she could never hold her lover again. Obviously though, with both of her hands sliced off, she couldn't really do much of anything and died from blood loss soon after. Either way, her ghost is now forever restless in this castle and makes itself regularly known to visitors. Obviously, the key identifier of this apparition is her lack of two hands. In fifth place, we have the Krampnitz Eagle. Alrighty, time for the usual disclaimers because the tube that is you does not like people chatting about all things World War II, so this girly has to be kinda goofy to get around that and get my point across. We're gonna chat about the bad guys, whose name starts with an N, but I'll be referring to them as Yahtzees. If you have an issue with that, take it up somewhere else. I've just gotta follow the interweb rules. Krampnitz in Germany was used as a cavalry training center during the First World War, and then as a motorized vehicle barracks by the uh, bad German guys during the Second 
World War, housing motorbikes, tanks, and armored vehicles. When the Russians took Berlin, the Germans fled, handing themselves over to the British and US forces rather than be captured by the Red Army, who soon claimed Krampnitz as their own. Yahtzee imagery, especially with the uh, big bad symbol whose name starts with an S, was banned in Germany after the war, and rightfully so. I know it wasn't originally a big bad symbol, I'm quite informed on the history of it and the name and different pronunciations, but Trust me, that's just the easiest way to get my point across. I think I'm doing enough dancing around words right now. I don't want to make anyone's head spin, least of all my own. Examples in public places were destroyed, and it is still illegal to display them outside of authorized exhibitions. However, at Krampnitz, this original and painstakingly crafted mosaic inlaid with gold leaf remained for decades. Some speculated the Russians may have kept it as a trophy of sorts, explaining its remarkable survival. But it remained there even after the Russians finally abandoned the site in 1992. The Krampnitz eagle appears to have been the very last genuine example of its kind. It was a haunting reminder of the reality of humanity's darkest days. It was eventually destroyed in the mid-2010s, and while I don't believe that Yahtzee stuff should be paraded about, it is kind of a shame that such intricate art has been lost to time. In fourth place, we have pickled creatures. It reminds me of right after high school, when I was helping to clean out my grandma's basement and found jars of pickled unknowns that had been pickled like before I was born. I was very grateful that none of the jars were open or broken, because who knows what they had turned into by that point. Boarding is genetic, and I am determined to break the chain of women from that side of my family tree, drowning in Belongings. Alrighty, back on track for now, I promise. Blame my ADHD. Anderlecht Veterinary College in Brussels was built in 1912 in a pretty Belgian neo Renaissance style, but left abandoned in 1991 when the whole campus moved location to the eastern Belgian town of Liege. Gosh, neo Renaissance architecture is so stunning, don't you think? Feel free to let me know in the comments what your favorite architecture style is. It could be a fun debate. The various buildings, which once contained pens for cattle and cages for primates and other mammals, were gradually converted, but one remained empty long after the others. Upstairs was a grand lecture hall complete with rows of plush red theater like chairs, while beautiful marble staircases and brass banisters adorned the other floors. The kind of place you know you just want to marvel at and curl up in just to imagine lives that came before yours. Down in the basement, however, lurking in a dark and long disused room were hundreds of macabre specimens of animals preserved in glass jars. I'm talking baby pigs, cows, and even parts of dogs, cats, and horses were among them. I'm glad my research elaborated on part of, because for a moment I was trying to picture a container large enough to hold a horse, and it was uh, kind of terrifying. Jawbones, internal organs, and some whole animals all waited to greet any unsuspecting explorer, with their glassy, faded eyes staring out through the yellowish tint of formaldehyde. Uh, good old formaldehyde. Some were smashed and laid rotting on tables and floors, making for a truly bizarre and disturbing sight, especially down there in the darkness, and only lit by torchlight. Also, imagine the smell. Okay, moving on before I gag from my overactive imagination taking over. In third place, we have a mummified body. Okay, Alexa, you can do it. You can fight the urge to hurl. Back in August of 2022, police in Milwaukee were asking for the public's help in identifying a man whose body was found in an abandoned building, and yep, you guessed it, most of the body was mummified. The remains were found on August 10th at 231 West Burley Street. Apparently the body was found by a YouTuber, but no clue as to who it might have been. Amy, the lead forensic investigator at the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner's Office, said the body had no identification on it. The medical examiner's office said a majority of the remains were mummified, except for the head, feet, and one hand. Because of the mummification, the medical examiner's office was able to identify tattoos in the body and submit them into a database. According to an investigation report from that examiner's office, the building was a multi-use building, with a church on the first floor and rooms upstairs, but had long been abandoned according to that report. Now, this spokesperson said the person appears to be a black male, based on the features discovered in the autopsy. The body also had tattoos and five rings on the fingers. One of the tattoos on the left arm says King, and another on the right arm has the letters S-A-V-A. -A. The body had further tattoos but they were too hard for investigators to distinguish. The man was also wearing a red allergy bracelet that was, you know, commonly used in hospitals. According to officials, the man had on multiple layers of clothing, including athletic pants and long underwear. He was also wearing what appeared to be like two jackets, so lots of layers. According to the autopsy report, from what they could tell, he didn't really have any injuries and there was no signs of drug use. Fun fact, bodies left in hot, you know, freezing environments can typically mummify in about two weeks, while the process typically takes a couple of months in enclosed locations. Remains in mild environments take about three months. When a person dies, the countdown to decomposition begins, as digestive enzymes start breaking down cells inside the body. In most cases, enzymes need to be in an aqueous environment to work, so if the fluids are removed, decomposition slows down. During spontaneous mummification, the body loses water more rapidly than the enzyme's destructive actions can operate. Bodies buried in crypts can accidentally mummify if ventilation, you know, is a thing. Not every part of the body mummifies at the same time though. Like some internal organs, like the heart, take a lot longer to dry out. Which makes sense. Whereas the hands, toes, and um, 
scrotum are among the fastest body parts to dry out. Like I said before, the environment can speed up the uh, process, often through extreme temperatures or pH levels that slow down the enzyme activity. Sometimes the soil surrounding the body plays a big part as well, either through osmosis or because heavy metals in the dirt can uh, impede the enzymes. Even clothes can help mummification because they act as a wick that absorbs bodily fluids from the skin. In addition to protecting the remains from the body's process of decomposing, the environmental conditions also have to defend against external threats like bacteria, fungi, and animals in order to ensure that a mummy will last. Figured that would all be worth learning about because why not? Am I still queasy? Sure, but it was worth it. In second place, we have the haunted crane mirror. So dating back to 1833, St. Bridget's Asylum in Ireland is among the oldest surviving examples of such buildings. It first opened its doors in, yep, 1833 as the Connacht District Lunatic Asylum and was considered one of the earliest of the Irish district asylums, hailing a new progressive role in mental health for Ireland, stating that it would care for the curable lunatics. I know that's out of date terminology, but it's a direct quote from history, not my own words. Hey, under that hospital standards, I'd fall under that category myself. Until recent history, ADHD was something people could grow out of, and that was something I was taught as a kid. I more so grew into mine, but that's not our point today. With the deinstitutionalization of mental health and the constant overcrowding, St. Bridget's Psychiatric Hospital was forced to close its doors in 2013. Designed in a prison-like radial plan from grim gray stone, by the 1920s it was grossly overcrowded, designed originally for 840 patients but holding almost 1,500. Sadly, this was the norm for many institutions, and not the exception. While many started off as well-meaning, and this was, you know, all over the world, demand was just too high and the pressure to overfill was given in too. So there are five main styles of asylum design. The corridor, pavilion, echelon, colony, but I'll elaborate more on the radio plan I mentioned for this place. The radial plan saw the long wings of the asylum radiate outwards from a central point, thus reflecting the style of prisons of that era. This style was considered inhumane even in its day due to the lack of natural light, circulation of air, and space for airing courts. So okay, maybe this specific asylum never had good intentions. Like all good mysteries, the crane mirror discovered in one of the rooms by urban explorers posed some intriguing questions. Standing alone in an otherwise unremarkable room, with its strange seashell motif and intricate dancing carved wooden cranes, it stood around 12 feet feet tall and suggested something perhaps more at home in a ballet school. But in the 19th century, and within an asylum, that explanation seemed most unlikely. Larger than any door or window in that room, I kind of wonder how they even managed to get it in there. But also, why go to such trouble? Was it some sort of strange passion project installed at the request of a former medical superintendent? Could there really have been ballet classes in an asylum, or was it part of some strange type of therapy? Perhaps it covered up like a doorway or something else hidden behind it? And if so, what? No satisfactory answer has yet been found. Explorers have mentioned that that specific room felt ice cold when they were in it, almost as if some sort of spirit had attached themselves to the area, which sounds accurate to me. While they couldn't find a death rate for the asylum, just assume it was high, and at least some poor soul passed there when they shouldn't have. I feel like I'm forgetting something. That'll come to me. Oh right, a different urban explorer found an old abandoned coffin sitting alone in the basement, which she thankfully discovered was empty. Personally, I don't think I would have dared open the thing. I'm too disgusted by what could be, and fearful of curses, but all the power to her. In first place, we have the West Park Asylum Brain Matter. Time to travel to another asylum, West Park Asylum, and this time to the abandoned mortuary and pathology labs, which sat nestled among the trees in a corner of the site. It had once been tucked away behind the asylum's chapel, but that was demolished back in the 1980s to make way for a staff car park, because priorities. Parking over history. Being home to up to 2,545 patients, death visited the asylum regularly, and the mortuary fridges had room for up to 12 bodies to be stored at any one time. Something about that ratio makes me think the more got overfilled quite a bit. One could wander the shabby abandoned wards of the asylum after closure and read the old log books that described patients dying in the night or after a fall or injury. Fluid and tissue samples were taken from some patients and stored in boxes or on glass slides, including chunks of brain, sealed in paraplast blocks, which is a waxy paraffin-based substance for uh, later study. Being unmarked, no one knows who they once belonged to, what they died of, or what lessons might have been learned from them. Anything that remained would have been eventually thrown away or burned, along with all the other fascinating artifacts this crazy asylum once contained. I'm both fascinated and grossed up by this. Not sure which side is winning. And that brings us to the end of our time, and uh, I think I'm definitely horrified. Talking about mental institutions takes a lot out of me mentally. But not intended. Number five on this list is Hashima Island. Hashima Island is honestly something straight out of a movie. In fact, it was even used in a movie before. 
For those James Bond fans out there, this island was where the villain in Skyfall had his evil lair. The History Network writes, Hashima Island is a vacant labyrinth of crumbling concrete, sea walls, and deserted buildings, yet it was once among the most densely populated places on the planet. The small island off the coast of Nagasaki was first settled in 1887 as a coal mining colony. It was later purchased by Mitsubishi, which built some of the world's first multi-story reinforced forced concrete buildings to house its bursting population. Hashima remained a hive of activity for the next several decades, especially during World War II when the Japanese forced thousands of Korean laborers and Chinese POWs to toil in its mines. By the 1950s, the 16-acre rock was packed to the gills with more than 5,200 residents. Most workers found the cramped conditions unlivable and the city was promptly abandoned after the mine closed in 1974. 40 years of neglect have left Hishima a dilapidated ruin of collapsed staircases and condemned apartments. Many of its high rises are still filled with old televisions and other relics from the mid 20th century and its once teeming swimming pools, barber shop, and school classrooms now sit in shambles. Similar to a lot of other entries on this list, this place isn't unfamiliar with death. A lot of those POWs who were forced to work here, they didn't make it out alive. Coal mining conditions were bad for those who did it voluntarily, but for those who were forced to do it, it was even worse. This place is just as cool as it is creepy. Like an abandoned island with high rises definitely gives a cool explorative vibe, but at the same point, there have been some creepy sightings here before. The mines are definitely believed to be haunted. People think that there are some sort of creatures living down there. Like the toxic fumes of the mine mutated someone or something and now there are these demons living down there. Only way to know for sure is if you find out for yourself, but I wouldn't recommend it. Number four on this list is Verosha. The story behind Verosha doesn't seem like anything that would happen in today's world. History Network says, in the early 1970s, the immaculate beaches of Verosha, Cyprus, served as one of the most popular millionaires playgrounds in the Mediterranean. The suburb boasted a thriving tourism economy and celebrities such as Elizabeth Taylor and Bridget Bardot were known to take in the sand and sun at its high-class beachfront hotels. All that that changed in August 1974 when Turkey invaded Cyprus and occupied its northern third in response to a Greek nationalist-led coup. Verocious 15,000 residents fled the city in terror, leaving their valuables and livelihoods behind. Most assumed they would return once the fighting stopped, but ongoing political strife has seen Verocia waste away behind a heavily guarded barrier ever since. The few intrepid explorers who had ventured into the no man's land described the resort as a crumbling ghost town. Trees have grown through the floors of restaurants and homes, and most of the former residents' belongings have been looted or destroyed. What is left stands as a spooky time capsule of the 1970s, including bell bottoms and shop windows, and 40-year-old vehicles still parked at car dealerships. Imagine fleeing your home with 15,000 other people and then just literally never being able to go back. We currently live in a society where, for the most part, we feel pretty safe and in our routines. But when you hear about something like this, it just puts life in perspective. That's how quick our entire lives can change and be totally uprooted. In a matter of minutes, we've lost our homes, our jobs, our money and we're now fending for our lives. What's left of this place is just a sad reminder of the lives that all these people were forced to leave behind. Number three on this list is Bodie. Bodie is a small ghost town located in California. This town was once a booming little community back in the late 1800s. Eventually, it busted though, and by the 1940s, the last few residents had to clear out because no one was coming anymore. It was a town for gold-crazed prospectors, and sounds like something right out of a western classic. The town was known not only for its gold, but also its drunken shootouts, brothels, gangsters, and drugs. It feels like the type of place that you would go to in Red Dead Redemption or something like that. 
It was actually known to many around the area as the Sea of Sin because of all of this. Eventually it just ran out of money though and slowly everyone had to leave. It's one of the most well preserved ghost towns in the world though and gives visitors a very clear picture of the darker side to the west back in the day. If you ever had dreams of being a western cowboy gangster then this is definitely the town for you. Number two on this list is Pripyat. Pripyat is located in Ukraine and definitely checks all of the creepy abandoned boxes. It's one of the main places that got affected by the nuclear accident that happened at Chernobyl. Back in 1986 the power plant had a horrible disaster and the 49,000 people who were living in this town they all had to leave. Anyone who was left behind or didn't go would have died soon after from the radiation poisoning. Many of the people who did leave had to deal with horrible health ramifications anyways because that's just how bad Chernobyl actually was. Now the town is left completely abandoned and in ruins. Nature is slowly taking control of what we've left behind. There was a small amusement park that once stood here and it's now a picturesque scene from a post-apocalyptic movie. Everything about this town screams creepy. Not to mention the fact that people have talked about potential mutant creatures living here. That hasn't been confirmed, but it's definitely heavily rumored by the locals. We still aren't allowed to go here for long periods of time because of the radiation poisoning and it may actually take centuries before it can be settled in again. And finally, Finally, number one on this list is Orador sur Glon. This once bustling French town is just a mass of rubble now after being completely decimated during World War II. The History Network says, on the afternoon of June 10th, 1944, the village of Orador sur Glan was the scene of one of the worst massacres of French civilians during World War II. In what is believed to have been an act of revenge for the town's supposed support of the French resistance, a German Waffen SS detachment rounded up and murdered 642 of its residents and burned most of their homes to the ground. Only a handful of people managed to survive by playing dead and later fleeing to the forest. A new Orador sur Glan was built nearby after the war ended, but French President Charles de Gaulle ordered that the burned out ruins of the old town be left untouched as a monument to the victims. The facades of dozens of brick buildings and charred storefronts still remain, as well as graveyards of rusted cars and bicycles, scattered sewing machines, and unused tram tracks. 642 residents. This just goes to show how horrible World War II actually was. 642 innocent people were killed on June 10th that day and Honestly guys, I didn't even know about this incident until I started researching for this video. Atrocities of this nature were simply commonplace during that time, which is just terrible to admit. Obviously this abandoned town is teeming with paranormal activity and is one of the saddest and darkest spots in all of France. People who have been through here have explained that sadness is literally palpable. The air grows thick and heavy, as if there are other presences around you that you can't see or touch. Several apparitions have been reported here as well as a deep fog that comes over the town very suddenly and without warning. Based on what happened here so many years ago, it's no wonder that this place is abandoned. Coming in at 5, Hashima Island, Japan. Hashima Island is an abandoned island lying about 15 kilometers from the city of Nagasaki in southern Japan. It is one of 505 uninhabited islands in Nagasaki. Nagasaki Prefecture. The island's most notable features are its abandoned concrete buildings, undisturbed except by nature and the surrounding sea wall. While the island is a symbol of the rapid industrialization of Japan, it is also a reminder of its history as a site of forced labor prior to and during the Second World War. The island reached a peak population of 5,259 in 1959, and in 1974, with the coal reserves nearing depletion, the mine was closed and all of the residents departed soon after leaving the island effectively abandoned for the following three decades. Interest in the island then re-emerged in the 2000s on account of its undisturbed historic ruins, and it gradually became a tourist attraction. The island is increasingly gaining international attention not only generally for its modern regional heritage, but also for the undisturbed housing complex remnants representative of the period from the Taisho period to the Showa period. It has become a frequent subject of discussion among enthusiasts for ruins. Since the abandoned island has not been maintained, several buildings have collapsed mainly due to typhoon damage, and other buildings are in danger of collapse. However, some of the collapsed exterior walls have been restored with concrete. The island was formally approved as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in July 2015 as part of Japan's sites of Japan's Meiji Industrial Revolution, iron and steel, shipbuilding and coal mining.
in at Fort Eastern State Penitentiary, Pennsylvania. The Eastern State Penitentiary, also known as ESP, is a former prison in Philadelphia that was operational from 1829 until 1971. The penitentiary refined the revolutionary system of separate incarceration, first pioneered at the Walnut Street Jail, which emphasized principles of reform rather than punishment. Notorious criminals such as Al Capone and bank robber Willie Sutton were also hulled inside its innovative wagon wheel design. Originally, inmates were housed in cells that could only be accessed by entering through a small exercise yard attached to the back of the prison. Only a small portal, just large enough to pass meals, opened onto the cell blocks. The design in turn proved impractical, and in the middle of construction, cells were constructed that allowed prisoners to enter and leave the cell blocks through metal doors that were covered by a heavy wood door to filter out noise. Some believe that the doors were small so prisoners would have a harder time getting out, minimizing an attack on a security guard. Others have explained the small doors forced the prisoners to bow while entering their cells. This design is related to penance and ties to the religious inspiration of the prison. The prison was one of the largest public work projects of the early republic, and was a tourist destination in the 19th century. Visitors spoke with prisoners in their cells, proving that inmates were not isolated, though the prisoners themselves were not allowed to have any visits with family or friends during their stay. The prison is now abandoned, however it operates as a museum and historic site, open year round. However, those who have visited have noted a weird presence inside its walls, and it is said that its former inmates haven't quite left the building yet. In at number 3, Aniva Rock Lighthouse, Russia The Aniva Lighthouse was built by the Japanese in 1939 on a chunk of rock off the southern coast of Sakhalin, just east of Russia. The island was largely uninhabited until the 1800s when both Japan and Russia became interested in annexing it. A ring of lighthouses were built on Sakhalin's rocky coast to signal incoming troop carriers and merchant ships. After around 50 years of sharing the island, the Russians annexed it all in the Second World War, causing half a million Japanese to be evacuated back to Hokkaido. In 1951, the Treaty of San Francisco was signed, officially handing tenure over to the Russians. Now the Aniva Lighthouse is abandoned, including its seven stories of diesel engines, accumulator rooms, keepers' living spaces, radio facilities, storerooms, large clockwork pendulum, and 300 kg pool of mercury. The place now looks like the perfect location for a horror movie, with the building completely deteriorating upon the rock due to the force of the water and wind. However, if you want to visit, you can. Regular tours are organized from Sakhalin's main city. During the six day journey, tourists can not only visit the lighthouse, but also enjoy the views of the city. Coming in at number two, Willard Asylum, New York. The Willard Asylum for the Chronic Insane is a former state hospital in Willard, New York, near Seneca Lake. The asylum was originally meant to rescue mentally ill people from county facilities where they were typically kept, often chained up or in cages. At Willard, the idea was that patients could be treated and hopefully rejoin society. In reality, Willard was more of a prison than it was a hospital, with patients being kept until the administrators decided they could leave. However, many never did. Worse still, not everyone who found themselves in the asylum were actually insane. Now, as of today, Willard is abandoned, but much of it still remains. The bowling alley built inside its walls during the later years is still standing, with several decaying pins remaining at the end of the lanes. The morgue is also still intact, with the autopsy tables in place next to the drawers where the bodies were stored. Now, in those days when a person died, it was shameful to have one's family name on the grave of a mental hospital. As such, out of respect, none of the graves were marked. Today, efforts are underway to find out who is buried in the graves and replace numbers with names. In the attic is where things have been unearthed though. In 1995, the same year the asylum closed, hundreds of suitcases were discovered in the attic. They had been left behind by the patients who never left the asylum. More than half of the 50,000 patients that came to Willard died within its walls, making this building one of the scariest in history. And finally, coming in at number one, Pripyat, the Chernobyl abandoned city. Yes, we're discussing an entire city with this one, not just one specific building, because honestly, there are way too many. Pripyat is a ghost city in northern Ukraine, near the Ukraine Belarus border. The city was founded on February 4th, 1970, as the ninth nuclear city in the Soviet Union to serve the nearby Chernobyl nuclear power plant. It was officially proclaimed a city in 1979 and had grown to a population of 49,360 by the time it was evacuated. 
created. On the afternoon of April 27, 1986, the day after the Chernobyl disaster. The Chernobyl disaster was a nuclear accident that occurred on the 26th of April 1986 at the number 4 nuclear reactor in the Chernobyl nuclear power plant near the city of Pripyat in the north of the Ukrainian SSR. It is to this day considered the worst nuclear disaster in history and is one of only two nuclear energy disasters rated at 7, the maximum severity on the international nuclear event scale. The accident began during a safety test on an RBMK type nuclear reactor which was commonly used throughout the Soviet Union. During this test a large amount of energy was suddenly released, vaporizing superheated cooling water and rupturing the reactor core in a highly destructive steam explosion. This was immediately followed by an open air reactor core fire that released considerable airborne radioactive contamination for about 9 days that precipitated onto parts of the USSR and Western Europe before finally being contained on May 4, 1986. Due to the radiation left behind, the entire city was evacuated, and all that remains are the abandoned buildings and a haunting Ferris wheel standing motionless in time. It had been scheduled to have its official opening five days after the disaster, in time for May Day celebrations. The Azure Swimming Pool and Avonhard Stadium are two other popular tourist attractions. You can only stay there two hours, otherwise you die. Number 5. Chernobyl I've made the executive decision to kick off today with the most obvious location. For those who might not be aware of the horrors of Chernobyl, allow me to start today off with a mini sad history lesson. So the disaster was a nuclear accident that occurred on the 26th of April of 1986 at the number 4 reactor in the Chernobyl nuclear power plant near the city of Pripyat. It is one of only two nuclear energy accidents rated at 7, which is the maximum severity on the international nuclear event scale, the other being the 2011 Fukushima nuclear disaster in Japan. The meltdown and explosions ruptured the reactor core. The meltdown and explosions ruptured the reactor core and destroyed the reactor building. So this was immediately followed by an open air reactor core fire, which lasted until May 4th of 1986, during which airborne radioactive contaminants were released and deposited onto other parts of the USSR and Europe. Approximately 70% landed in Belarus, around 16 kilometers away. The fire released about the same amount of radioactive material as the initial explosion. In response to the initial accident, a 10 kilometer radius exclusion zone was created 36 hours after the accident, from which approximately 49,000 people were evacuated, primarily from Pripyat. The exclusion zone was later increased to a radius of 30 kilometers, from which an additional 68,000 people were evacuated. Following the disaster, Pripyat was abandoned and eventually replaced by the new purpose-built city of Slavutich. In July of 2019, the Ukrainian president announced that the Chernobyl site would become an official tourist attraction. Immunology experts recommend that tourists wear clothes and shoes they are comfortable with throwing away, avoid plant life, especially the depths of the forest due to the high levels of radiation. Oh, why? Oh, you know, just because the areas were not cleaned in the aftermath of the Oh, just because the areas were not cleaned in the aftermath of the disaster and remain highly contaminated. Research showed that fungus, moss, and mushrooms are radioactive. So among the buildings that were abandoned were multiple schools, with the small city having 15 preschools for just under 5,000 attendees. Most of the buildings in the city are practically empty, but not the schools. School books and class magazines were clearly of no value to looters, and city residents were more worried about saving at least something from their personal property, leaving the buildings almost intact, minus the effects of being left empty over time. Moving on to other places of note, the Pripyat Amusement Park was set to have its grand opening on the 1st of May in 1986, in time for the media celebrations, but those plans were cancelled on April 26. Several sources report that the park was opened for a short time on the 27th, before the announcement to evacuate the city was made to distract the residents from the unfolding disaster nearby. Constructed under the Soviet Union as a park of culture and rest, typical of many large cities in the then Soviet Union, the amusement park's Attractions were manufactured by the Yezis. The amusement park's attraction were manufactured by the firm Attraction, who were responsible for the construction of many of the amusement parks which remain to be seen around the former Soviet Union today in various states of repair. Located northwest to the Palace of Culture in the center of Pripyat, the park had five attractions the iconic 26 meter Ferris wheel titled Circular Overview, the Autodrome bumper cars, a paratrooper ride called Chamomile, Russian swing swing boats, and also a carnival shooting game. Fun fact the successor to the original company is still manufacturing the Ferris wheel, paratrooper, and bumper 
cars with a similar design as of 2017. Radiation levels around the park vary. The liquidators wash radiation into the soil after the helicopters carrying radioactive materials use the grounds as a landing strip, so concrete areas are less radioactive. However, areas where moss is built up can emit levels amongst the highest levels of radiation in the whole area. So the Ferris wheel actually made news in September of 2017 when Polish tourists turned it mechanically for the first time since 1986, later returning it to its original position. As much as it would be fascinating to explore history, I'll wait till it's a little less detrimental to my health. Number 4. The Paris Catacombs Deep underground the city of Paris are hundreds of miles of tunnels in a complex network that is one of the oldest in the world. It's a darker city that few tourists experience due to the high risk of danger. You know, people often get lost. The walls can also collapse at any moment, so many who venture there wear miners' helmets. There's no electricity among the endless winding canal canals. There's no electricity amongst the endless winding canals, corridors, and crypts filled with mounds of unidentified skulls, which are estimated to be about six million deceased Parisians. There are parts so tight that you have to lie on your belly and slither forward like a worm to get through. Only a small section of the catacombs is accessible to tourists, while the rest has been illegal to enter since 1955. Look, I'm not saying you shouldn't explore the tourist accessible areas. Heck, you know, I want to visit those myself, but stay out of the illegal areas. Urban explorers who frequent the catacombs call them cat. Urban explorers who frequent the catacombs call themselves cataphiles, which I must admit is a very smart moniker. They paint, sculpt, and create other art while also building false walls, trap doors, and secret chutes to keep away the cataflix or catacops who try to catch them trespassing. You must know a cataphile who can be your guide to even try to explore the unknown, or else risk getting lost or stuck for who knows how long. As much as I love exploring creepy history, the thought of getting lost in such a cursed place is a type of scared I'm not fond of and don't particularly ever want to experience. Number 3. The Island of Poveglia Yep, an entirely abandoned island, and it's got quite the history. So the island is located in the lagoon near Venice and is famous for being one of the most haunted places in all of Italy. Tourists and locals alike are banned from the island, which was used for centuries as a place to exile the sick to prevent the spread of disease and contain the mentally ill in an asylum built in the late 1800s. Yeah, yeah, I'll backtrack and elaborate. In 1348, the bubonic plague arrived in Venice and Poveglia, like many other small islands at the time, and it became a quarantine colony. The plague on average killed one out of three Europeans, so fearing the crazy spread of the disease, Venice exiled many of its symptom-bearing citizens there. You know, Go go! At the island center, the dead and those too sick to protest were burned on giant pyres. This included the tens of thousands of Venice citizens dying on the mainland. These fires were burned once more in 1630 when the Black Death again swept through the city. A small island was used as a mass burial ground, and ashes from human remains make up as much as 50% of the island's soil, so I hope it's a good fertilizer. The deaths of nearly 160,000 people on the island have given it its nickname, the Island of Ghosts. A doctor at the asylum was known to have experimented on patients with crude lobotomies and jumped from the bell tower in the 1930s after claiming he had been driven mad by ghosts. Decades later, nearby residents claimed to still hear the bell, although it was removed many years earlier. A report titled Haunted History states that some restoration work has started in recent history, but abruptly stopped without explanation. So maybe this is one spot on today's list that I don't want to visit, like, ever. Number 2. Bodhi State, Histo Number two, Bodhi State Historic Park Formerly a genuine gold mining town located east of the Sierra Nevada mountain range in Mono County, California, and now a national landmark, it is known as one of the best preserved ghost towns in the world. It is named after W.S. Bodie, first name unknown, but rumored to be either William or Waterman, who discovered gold in 1859 in an area now known as Brody Bluff. He tragically passed away in a snowstorm that same winter and was never present for what came to be. According to pioneer Judge McClinton, the district's name was changed from the proper spelling of B-O-D-E-Y to B-O-D-Y and then a few other phonetic variations to eventually B-O-D-I-E after a painter in the nearby boomtown of Aurora lettered a sign as such, an accidental typo that got stuck through history. Which is a good reminder to proofread your work. While the output from the mine is largely insignificant in terms of mining history, the violence and early endings to lives tell a different story. A particularly harsh winter between 1878 and 79 claimed hundreds of lives, with many others perishing from falling timber and explosions underground. Bodhi as a town grew to have a reputation for violence and lawlessness, and unlike other mining camps at the time, killings were daily events. Robberies, stage holdups, and fights happened at such a frequency that no complete record could be kept. Reverend F. M. Warrington would describe the area in 1881 as a sea of sin, lashed by tempests of lust and passion. The first of four mysterious fires tore through the business district in 1892, the next destroying the town mill in 1912, and another destroying the same mill again in 1898. The last of the unknown fires demolished the last of the unknown fires demolished most of what was left of the now ghost town in 1932, taking many lives too soon in the process. When the last producing mine shut down after 1945, very few people were left living in what 
what was left of the town, and all eventually met untimely ends. One man shot his wife unprompted, and three other men from the town took it upon themselves to take his life for the act. According to historians, the ghost of that man would visit the three men after his passing, shaking his fist and appearing as if he was uh, cursing them out. Those men soon died of mysterious diseases and illnesses. Visitors to the area have reported meeting spirits that leave them feeling suffocated, seeing doors open and close on their own, and rocking chairs that may or may not have a menacing older lady staring them down, or even the empty chair rocking on its own. Nowadays, if you remove anything from the land, even like a little pebble, you'll be cursed with remorse and tragedy. The curse is upheld by the ghosts of residents past, who guard against thieves and protect the town's treasures. So kleptos, steer clear or be cursed. Number 1. Plymouth the Caribbean, the Caribbean island of Montserrat was quite the getaway spot in the 1980s after music producer Sir George Martin opened a recording studio there, called Air. The appeal of working with his team and spending a few weeks or months recording in a tropical paradise was so compelling that the world's most famous rock stars, you know, had a good time there. We're talking like Mick Jagger, Elton John, Stevie Wonder, and Paul McCartney all laid down tracks. The party sadly ended abruptly when twin disasters struck the island. Beginning on the 18th of July in 1995, a series of huge eruptions at the South Friar Hills volcano, which had been inactive for centuries, sent pyroclastic flows and ash falls across a wide area of southern Montserrat, including the capital of Plymouth. On the 21st of August in 1995, Tephra fell on Plymouth, necessitating an evacuation that lasted until September 3rd. Following renewed volcanic activity on the 1st of December, residents were evacuated for the second time, but were allowed back on the 1st of January. On April 3rd, it was evacuated for the third and final time. The island was divided into risk zones. During some periods, entry into Plymouth was, you know, entry into Plymouth was prohibited, and at other times it was allowed during daytime only to those with a means of rapid escape. And the last time that access was legally allowed to the area during daytime was June 16th of 1997, which was right before I was born. On the 25th of June, a mass, a further massive eruption produced pyroclastic surges that killed 19 people and reached nearly to the island's airport on the eastern side of the island, which had remained open until that time. Between the 4th to the 8th of August of that year, a further series of large eruptions destroyed approximately 80% of the town, burying it under 1.4 meters of ash. This hot material burned many of the buildings, making habitation nearly impossible for many of the residents. The flows, lava, ash, and other volcanic rock types were mostly compact, having a density similar to that of concrete. The removal of the overburden would have required the use of explosives, bulldozers, and other resources way too expensive for all of this. It was anticipated that the soil underneath the hardened mud and lava would have been scorched and left completely non-arable by the intense heat of the pyroclastic flows. The entire south half of the island was declared an exclusion zone because of the continuing volcanic activity at the hills. So the government of the island was moved north to the town of Brady's, although Plymouth still remains the technical capital. Recently, Montserrat has chaperoned, Montserrat has begun chaperoning uh, driving tours into the exclusion zone, where visitors can walk through the ruins of the formal cap where visitors can walk through the ruins of the former capital, which now lies buried under some 20 feet of ash and stone, where the smoking volcano still pumps over 350 tons of sulfur dioxide into the sky every day. During a tour, one sees modern concrete buildings shattered by the unbelievable force of nature. Over 10 feet of ash and mud have buried so much of the city that in certain areas only rooftops poke up from the dust. We're talking like papers and envelopes are stacked on desktop piles of work, which were made pointless by the pile of ash that fills up the floor and outside balconies. 19 people died from breaking the lawn entering the exclusion zone before it was safe, by the way. The hot gas cooked their lungs, and they looked similar to mummies when they were eventually found. Yeah. Big pass from me. In fifth place, we have Port Arthur. Port Arthur is a town and former convict settlement on the Tasman Peninsula in Tasmania, Australia. The site forms part of the Australian convict sites, a world heritage property consisting of 11 remaining penal sites originally built within the British Empire during the 18th and 19th centuries on Australian coastal strips. So collectively, these sites including Port Arthur, are described by UNESCO as the best surviving examples of large-scale convict transportation and the colonial expansion of European powers through the presence and labor of convicts. From 1833 until 1877, Port Arthur was the destination for those deemed the most hardened of convicted British criminals, those who were secondary offenders having re-offended after their arrival in Australia. Rebellious personalities from other convict stations were also sent there. In addition, Port Arthur had some of the strictest security measures of the British penal system. So, as you can imagine, that would produce some pretty scary figures still kicking around with a grudge to hold. One popular figure who has been spotted frequently goes by the moniker of Reverend George. A tour coordinator for the settlement is adamant that photos have been captured of the spirit, usually near the parsonage, which is where he's believed to have passed some time in the 1870s. One of the more fearful spirits spotted on the grounds is named John Gold, a nasty convict who enjoys leering at unsuspecting visitors, often causing uh, younglings to throw uncharacteristic tantrums 
and more. All in all, apparently there are more than 2,000 reports of unexplained activity, all bundled into 20 bulging files full of sightings of ghosts and strange emotional reactions to the buildings. In fourth place, we have the Adelaide Goal. Thought to be one of the most haunted places in South Australia, the Adelaide Goal is said to be regularly visited by some of the inmates and prison officers who once wandered its halls. First off, Frederick, otherwise known as Fred Carr, went the way of the uh, rope necklace on the 12th of November of 1927 for the killing of his wife, Maud. He protested his innocence, even up until the final moments before his death, exclaiming that the law required his body, but it cannot have his soul as he is innocent. Fred is said to regularly appear near the stairs leading to the upstairs cells of the new building. He is reported as a happy spirit, always neatly dressed in dark clothes and taking a polite interest in visitors wandering through his former home. Well, I'm uh, glad one of the ghosties is a uh, chipper. Next up, we have William Baker Ashton, who was the first governor of the Adelaide Goal, and despite being a reasonably fair man, he was accused of wrongdoing. William was a very large man, and when he died in his office in 1854, his body could not be manipulated down his apartment's steep, narrow staircase. Instead, he was unceremoniously lowered out of the front window to the undertakers waiting below. Three months after his death, William was exonerated which was a little too late. On warm, still nights with a hint of thunder in the air, his footsteps are said to be heard through the walls of solid stone as he struggles to move furniture in an empty room. Finally, Ben Ellis was the hangman for 10 years, from the mid-1860s to mid-1870s, and lived in a small apartment below what became the female dormitory. Ben took pride in his work and approached each task with complete professionalism and never questioned the right or wrong of his profession until the 30th of December of 1873, when he was required to hang a female prisoner, Elizabeth Wolcock. She was to be the first and only woman executed in South Australia. So this event changed the way Ben viewed his profession forever, and his restless spirit is said to appear often throughout the residence. In third place, we have the Monte Cristo Homestead. The two-story Victorian manor was built by pioneer Christopher William Crawley in the New South Wales town of June in 1885 before his homestead became riddled with death and now claims to be the most haunted house in Australia. To be specific, a stable boy burned to death, a tiny human was thrown down the stairs, a maid was lobbed off a balcony, and a caretaker kaboomed to death, among others. Pardon me, I jumped straight to the good stuff without the history. <clears throat> Christopher Crawley first built the mansion in, yep, 1885, where he lived with his wife wife Elizabeth, their seven kiddos, and a series of servants. He was a wealthy farmer and landowner who had made his fortune in Juni, a small town in the Riverina region, after the Great Southern Railway Line opened in 1878. With the success of his hotel and land sales, Christopher was able to retire early and began construction on his Monte Cristo homestead. This home was a status symbol for the Crawley family, and a social hub for the town's most wealthy. Now despite all the glamour, the Crawleys are said to have been holding on to many dark secrets and tragedies. Remember a moment ago when I mentioned that a uh, a young maid was said to have fallen to her death from the second story balcony. Well, um, a bleach stain still remains where the scarlet life force was attempted to be removed and footsteps can be heard pacing the top balcony in the middle of the night. Some even see the outline of a female figure on the balcony as well. The Crawleys themselves weren't immune from the, you know, deathly Monte Cristo. Their youngest daughter, a under a year old, died when her nanny accidentally dropped her down the stairs. Some claim it was on purpose, while others have ruled it as an accident. Feel free to let me know your theories in the comments. So the Monte Cristo homestead remained empty for over a decade after the last Crawley left in 1948. In 1963, Olive and Reginald Ryan purchased the now rundown manor for only about a thousand Australian dollars. That's a bargain. Bone chilling paranormal experiences were part of everyday life for the Ryan family, with Olive claiming to have had her name called out multiple times, only to find no one there. All of the offspring have also reported sightings of figures in old fashioned clothes and have felt cold hands on their shoulders. Not the best place to grow up. In second place, we have the Airedale Mental Hospital. It's estimated that an astonishing 13,000 people passed away within the walls of the so-called Ararat Lunatic Asylum over its 140 years of operation, which made it perfect for today's list. So the now known Airedale Asylum was a psychiatric hospital in Ararat, a rural city in Victoria, Australia. So now considered a ghost town, the Airedale Asylum campus contains over 70 now abandoned buildings that once housed over a thousand patients. As with many asylums of the time, it was meant to be self sufficient and provide the patients, or inmates as they were referred to at the time, with labor that was believed to help in their treatments. Despite its closure as an asylum in 1993, the facility was used to house female prisoners during the renovation of the Dame Phyllis Frost Center. Now while reports exist of apparitions, phantom sounds, visitors experiencing nausea, fainting and pain, some ghosts from Airedale's past have made themselves known to those who are alive today.
today. George Fenimont was the last governor, so in 1886, he was showing a group of people around the asylum when they started down a set of stairs. Suddenly, George fell to his knees, suffering a major heart attack, and uh, passed on the spot. These days, tour guides and visitors hear heavy footsteps and banging on that same stairwell, but when they go to take a look, no one's there. Gary Webb was a career criminal and had a long rap sheet when he was finally taken into custody and sent to stay at Airedale. Gary got comfortable there and started to write letters to the media, telling them the inhuman and horrible things he was planning to do once he got out. Citizens began to worry, and a special law was passed to keep him contained there for the rest of his life. He began to uh, self-mutilate at this time and was hospitalized over 70 times. He even castrated himself three times during his sentence. So today, Gary is said to haunt his former room, screaming at visitors to uh, get out and pushing them out the door. Visitors to the hospital who happen to walk past the office of the former superintendent reporting a sudden bitter taste in their mouth. Would you like to know why? Of course you do. The superintendent ended his life in his office after swallowing cyanide. The rest of the woman's ward is haunted by a ghost named Nurse Carrie. She is said to watch over the tour guides. Her apparition, as well as others, have been seen in the woman's ward, donning old time nurses' uniforms and disappearing into stone walls. Other folks report a tingling sensation in their head when they enter what used to be the uh, shock therapy room. In the J ward in particular, visitors report feeling ill and suddenly afraid. Others slip into a trance, only released from it when they exit the building. Some people have even been bitten or pushed while walking through the J ward. The ward is also said to you know, be haunted by three prisoners who were uh, went the way of the rope necklace and buried on the property. They are said to be restless because they weren't given a proper burial and their graves are only marked with three scratches on the prison wall. Uh, could somebody fix it and give them a proper burial? Please? In first place, we have the entire town of Picton, New South Wales. So according to my research, it's the most haunted town in Australia. But you know, Picton is also known for its countryside views and paranormal gardens. The town is located about 80 kilometers southwest of Sydney and has a historical significance due to its buildings and railway tunnels. The Mushroom Tunnel, also known as the former Red Bank Range Railway, is our main focus for today. There are famous tales of ghosts drifting around the tunnel, with the most popular being linked with a terrible railway accident involving a woman named Emily Bollard. Apparently when the tunnel was still in use by the railway, Emily had been walking through it and was uh, killed by an oncoming locomotive. It is unclear whether she deliberately ended her life or if her death was just an unfortunate accident. Accident. Reports suggest people often witness Emily and two other women ghosts and also hear some scary voices. You know, just some cryings and shrieks. No biggie. The apparition of Emily has been seen in the depths of the tunnel and is described as a white flowing figure of a woman with no face. Many people have also reported a sudden drop of temperature, eerie shadows, gusts of wind, orbs body chills, and many weird other things happening inside the tunnel. The tunnel was apparently used to store mustard gas, spray tanks, and ammunition during World War II. It was also used as a mushroom farm, ergo the mushroom moniker amongst locals. From time to time, black shadows or figures have been seen on walls throughout the tunnel. Some witnesses have reported white lights hovering above people's heads and figures appearing out of the darkness. Ghostly younglings have been witnessed and electrical disturbances have occurred to devices in the tunnel. People have also felt, you know, sudden drops in temperature. Oh, almost forgot, there is a ghost train hunting the tunnel, because human spirits aren't enough. During a tour group experience, one witness recounted that when they reached the tunnel, he said the entire group noticed a random light in the distance and the sound of a steam train overwhelming the area. He said that everyone, including the tour guide, scrambled to hug the walls. And now remember, this tunnel has been inactive for almost 50 years at this time. The witness claims he felt the wind on his face as he closed his eyes and the train passed. Want to hear about a ghosty haunting the cemetery near the tunnel? Of course you do. Blanche Moon was a youngling who died in 1886 and haunts the cemetery. She was the daughter of Henry and Fanny Moon, and her father is believed to have been the timber worker who helped make the railway sleeper she fell off of while playing, which is the fall that led to her death. In January of 2010, a family visiting St. Mark's Cemetery snapped a photo apparently showing the ghosts of two younglings who died almost 60 years apart. And yep, you guessed it. One of them is believed to be Blanche Moon herself. The family claimed that there were no young people in the cemetery at the time the photo was taken, and that the figures of the two were only noticed when the pictures were downloaded to a computer. Other places in Picton rumored to be haunted are the Imperial Hotel, where many staff report the feeling of someone following them through several parts of the building, and at times, the jukebox begins to play, even though it's not connected to power. Wallandilly Shire Hall, which is reported to be haunted by three ghosts, including a bearded man wearing a hat and suit, a small mischievous boy, 
and a little girl who was most often heard rather than seen. Stone Quarry Viaduct, where over the years many people have uh, drowned in the creek. Locals have heard ghoulish sounds of people swimming and splashing in said creek. And finally, Emmett Cottages, where the ghost of a woman is seen in the window of the building, and shop owners often find their displays have been moved overnight. In at number five, we have SCP-470, abandoned office building. This SCP appears to be a large abandoned office building and has had no registered owner for years. The building was abandoned after the collapse of the corporation that used to house this building. The structure is seven floors and is in a state of disrepair as it hasn't seen any sort of life since it was abandoned. SCP-470 is known for its rooms to internally shift and become other locations that have been abandoned for a great amount of time. These outside locations appear within SCP-470 all have to have no human interaction or observation for 20 to 30 years. The rooms in this building exist both in their original physical location and within 470 at the same time. The locations that appear in 470 will flicker from time to time as they are unstable. It has been observed that one can remove a room from 470 by increasing the levels of human activity at the original physical location of the room that is manifesting. The longer the area has little to no human interaction, the stronger its connection with 470 is. At the beginning of the shift, rooms are only able to be manifested into 470 if they have absolutely no human activity. Though after long periods of abandonment, rooms are able to be manifested with as many as 14 people inside. The dangerous part about this SCP is that the rooms within it do not always originate in our human reality or dimension. Some of these rooms are constructed of non-terrestrial elements. No items or people are to enter or exit 470 or the external containment area without government approval. Additionally, anyone that is to enter must be equipped with a PSD tracking bug and be a part of groups in no less than 20 at all times to prevent any issues when observing 470. In at number 4 we have SCP-1730, abandoned building again. This SCP is known to be a large complex structure that is 15 kilometers northwest of the US-Mexico border. 1730 was discovered on June 5th and when it was found was in a severe state of disrepair as it was left abandoned for an extended period of time. It is also important to note that due to the low survival rate of individuals who have come in contact with 1730, it is possible that it had been previously discovered but unreported. Inside 1730 there was classified documents that supported the theory that the building was once Foundation Site 13 and originally located near Alaska. Upon discovering 1730 it was clearly abandoned, yet the site power generated continued to operate in a damaged state with multiple fuel leaks and fires throughout the facility. This resulted in power failures and hindering exploration and rescue missions. The origin of this SCP is still unknown, as is what happened within the building. It is believed that human survivors existed deep in the lower basement level of the facility. This is because there are messages written in English throughout the basement with warnings such as danger and what happened to Site 13. Furthermore, there were many entries of data that were collected by remaining functional terminals. The collected data consisted of site layout, staff information and contained anomalies. The containment procedures is very very specific for this SCP and consists of a 2 km circular perimeter, with a quarantine zone that is established 1 km from the SCP. People that enter 1730 must use hazardous contact preparation measures, including a reinforced airtight suit. When exiting the quarantined area, one must submit through decontamination protocols that are administered by the security staff. If failed to pass the quarantine protocol, individuals are held for further decontamination, or in the case of decontamination being unfeasible, termination is to be expected. In at number 3 we have SCP-1983, Doorway to Nowhere. 1983 is a cater class object under SCP Foundation's containment. It was combined by SCP-1983-1 and SCP-1983-2. 1983-1 is a one story farmhouse in Wyoming. It was abandoned in 1968 after a series of rituals were allegedly performed there by a cult and was discovered after a series of mysterious deaths in the surrounding area of a Wyoming county. The front door of SCP-1983-1, when opened, appears to contain a spatial anomaly. Neither matter nor light has been observed to exit the doorway. 1983-1 is accessible through other entrances, including windows, the back door, and entrances cut into 
onto the back of 1983 one. However, the front room does not appear to exist inside of 1983 one. Doors that should lead to the front room instead lead to other doors inside the building. Measurements of the inside and outside of 1983 one are inconsistent. Holes cut through the interior walls of 1983 one that should lead to the front room lead instead to the outside walls around the front of 1983 one, but stop three meters on either side of the doorway. At some point, the doors stopped leading to darkness and instead led to their natural rooms, which contain the remains of every agent or class D sent in. Found in the abandoned building are 1983-2, which are creatures that appear as humanoids but are entirely black in color. Additionally, they are highly aggressive and will engage any human on sight. When an instance of 1983-2 meets a human, their animal instinct kicks in, and in a matter of seconds, the human meets their fate. 1983 is presumed to have been neutralized by D-14134, who was posthumously awarded the Foundation Star. Due to information contained in document 1983-15, it is believed that the anomaly was not localized as previously believed, and renewed resources have gone into attempting to locate similar incidents. Coming in at number 2, we have SCP-087, The Staircase. Located in an abandoned building, the doorway leading to 087 is reinforced steel with an electric lock mechanism. Additionally, the door that leads to the staircase has been disguised to resemble a janitorial closet consistent with the design of the building, deterring people to enter. The high intense security system in an abandoned stairwell is for good reason though, as this SCP is very dangerous. 087 is an unlit platform of descending stairs consisting of 13 steps before reaching a semicircular platform. The design of this SCP is to limit subjects to have a limited range when coming in contact with 087. A light source is required for any subjects exploring 087 as there are no lighting fixtures or windows present. Lighting sources brighter than 75 watts have shown to be ineffective, as 087 seems to absorb excess light. Subjects report audio recordings confirm the distress vocalizations from which is theorized to be from a human. These distressing calls for help is estimated to be located far below the initial platform. However, any attempts to descend the staircase have failed to bring subjects closer to the source. The depth of descent calculated from exploration 4, the longest exploration, is shown to be far beyond both the possible structure of both the building and geological surroundings. And at this time, it's unknown if 087 has an endpoint. This seemingly endless staircase is cloaked in darkness, leaving exploration tips not for the faint hearted. Many people that have chosen to explore the inside of 087 have disappeared inside and never returned. It's unknown if 087 is the cause of their disappearances, though it is most likely. 087 is aware of the foundation's presence, as it will stare into discarded video equipment. Individuals who manage to escape 087 and get back to the top of the staircase often have long lasting mental issues and physical fatigue. In every documented exploration of 087, every subject has witnessed 0871 appear nearby, or will either stare at them from the darkness, causing mental degradation, or lunge at or chase them through the stairwell in an extremely violent and aggressive manner. That's my worst fear. I hate going upstairs. I don't want to be chased. Do you feel that fear when you go up a set of stairs? That someone's just going to start running? No, it's that someone's just all of a sudden going to start running behind you and chasing you. Yeah, but that's the fear. You can only go so fast up a set of stairs. Due to the results of the final exploration, no one is permitted access to 087. Knowing all of this, and the many individuals who failed to come out of 087 after no exploration, you now know that the door is sealed for a reason. And finally, in at number one, we have SCP-563, Abandoned Plot of Farmland. Known as the abandoned plot of farmland in China, 563 is where the other SCP livestock were recovered. The facility of 563 has since been discovered, been modified for the factory farming of animals that weigh up to several tons. 563 is equipped to handle orange poultry, but specifically SCP poultry. At the time of recovering 563, the livestock of 563A, for instance, was found. Several SCP species of dinosaurs and related reptiles that are native to China and Mongolia and the Jurassic and Cretaceous period. When alive, 563A were farmed to create instances of 563B. 563B is the prehistoric food line of products made
made by a company known as the Ancient Dragon Culinary Corporation. Records of this company have been found, but the locations of their main office and the institutions involved in the production of 563B has not yet been established. 563B products are sold in several East Asian countries, but have been discovered in some supermarket chains in the USA. Various instances of 563B include Dragon Bone Tea, Ancient Dragon Velociraptor Noodles, and Kentucky Fried Tyrannosaurus. Prosumers examination of all 563A instances found that up to 79% of the individuals found had prion in their system prior to their death. Testing on this prion found it to be similar to prion that causes Kuru, suggesting that 563A instances had been fed or were feeding on the meat of the same species. Notably, most species of raptor found on site were immune to this prion. The containment procedures for the 563 consistent of all carcasses of 563A have been removed from the farmland, within minimal containment of 563 required. It is to be surrounded by a perimeter of motion trackers at every 3 meters to track any sort of movement. Coming in number 5, Centralia, Pennsylvania. Sounds like a nice enough place, right? Who would abandon a prosperous coal mining community filled with interesting folks and a fun name? Well, anyone who likes to breathe things other than noxious gas. Oh, This one is less a mystery and more of a straight up fact, but the abandonment is super scary regardless of how you look at it. Way back in the day, Centralia was bustling. Rich veins of coal were discovered underneath the earth here and folks were really excited to bring it up to the surface. What better way to make a profit? Unfortunately, this subterranean resource and favorite of Minecraft kids across the globe is also the reason for Centralia's downfall. Mm -hmm. The very same stuff that brought about plenty of business also made the town uninhabitable. Tragic and maybe a nice little microcosm of the human experience. Apparently a landfill burn spread a little further than folks were expecting and ignited the underground coal. From an abandoned coal mine to the rich veins of black gold underground, this fire spread like, well, wildfire, scorching everything around. 140 acres of town, gone, just like that. A lot of it is still standing, but it's not safe to be around. The underground fires belch all sorts of horrid smoke, and many large sinkholes opened up due to the fire's influence. These days, you might sense a presence or two while passing by, but don't worry, they're not ghosts. Not yet, anyways. Of the few thousand who used to live there, only about a half dozen remain. They refuse to abandon their once lovely town, determined to live amidst the smoke and gas, the fire and flames. It doesn't look like the fires are going out anytime soon either. Some estimates see the blaze continuing on for a few hundred years, thanks to the constant supply of fuel underground. Coming in number 4, we've got Deception Island, Antarctica. Another wild and wonderful name. If I could choose to name the place I lived in anything, Deception would definitely be on the list. That's the kind of town that famous folk albums get named after, a place of legend for miles around. A place of rest perhaps. or. Place of mystery. Deception is often thought of as a negative thing. Nobody likes being lied to, but if it's done well enough, deception can achieve plenty of things. But I'm getting off topic. We should be discussing the actual abandoned place, full of mystery, full of danger. Deception Island was a long used whaling station back in the day. Norwegian folks would post up there for long stretches of time, enjoying the island's safe natural harbor. Eventually, it became known for its research potential, attracting all sorts of folks from Britain and Chile. Now, I know what you're all thinking a research base out in the middle of deep freeze nowhere. Well, there's got to be some sort of lunatic alien there, morphing into different shapes and eating everyone for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And my mind went to the same place. But even after all of this, the island was also used as a British base during World War II, so maybe less deadly aliens after all, because the soldiers would have run into something like that. Although this island is also home to the largest cemetery in Antarctica, so chew on that for however long you need to. These days, the area is protected as a heritage site, so all of the abandoned, decrepit shacks, huts, and buildings are still there to be seen. Who knows what secrets and spirits lurk within, perishing due to cold, war, or something more supernatural. Oh, and one last thing about this location. Even though it's as cold as ice and difficult for any living being to survive out here, there is something else that makes it even more dangerous. There are occasional volcanic eruptions on the island. Pardon me? So yeah, you'd best stay far, far away from this long abandoned haven. Even haven seems like a bit of a misnomer, don't you think? Coming in number 3, we've got Glen Rio, New Mexico slash Texas. Or should I say, New Texaco. Maybe that's a little cheesy for your liking, but I'll say it anyway. This border town was once a hotspot for tourists, motorists, evangelists, and top 5 lists. Still is, considering that last one. 
However, like so many spots built along old school highways, this town relied heavily on those just passing through. So when a much bigger, faster, safer highway opened up far away from Glen Rio's limits, the whole place saw some terrible downswing. Gas stations, eateries, general stores and mechanics all found that there wasn't much to do if the highway traffic wasn't coming through. A tough break for sure. What remains could pass for a location out of a new Fallout game. Empty buildings adorned with imagery consistent with the campy American dream. Burnt out husks of old cars, never to rev their engines again. Empty sun bleached motels with rotted out mattresses and busted windows. If anyone wanted to live their post apocalyptic dream life, here would be the place. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me if a few ghouls were roaming the wastes, eking out a modest life amidst the emptiness. When something so obviously meant to be jam packed with people is devoid of all life, it can be extremely unnerving. And Glen Rio exemplifies this in spades. If I were to visit, I would expect dead silence. However, were some old fashioned scratchy radio tunes to start playing, I would understand. That's just the ghosts of those who believed in the town trying to boogie after hours. Coming in number 2 we've got Oficina Chacabuco in Chile. A lot of ghost towns are left abandoned, with the occasional explorer stumbling through to see what life was all about. When whatever the town relied upon for prosperity, whether it be natural resources, tourism or celestial protection runs dry, people drift away. Over time that means the town is no longer what it used to be, a shell, a husk. It's sad, but it's also just the natural byproduct of industrialization. If a place can no longer be useful. It's cut. However, some people can find other uses for these sinister feeling places. Officina Chacabuco is just such a place. Making its money through nitrate mining at one point, this spot lost a lot of business when petroleum based fertilizers became the next big thing. Without any other resources to rely upon, those who made their living here had to hightail it out. This left the remote town empty for a number of years. However, during General Pinochet's bloody rule in the 70s, this place was used for something else entirely. Political prisoners would be forcefully brought here and left to fend for themselves in the ghost town. They couldn't escape either as the regime set up a wicked barrier of barbed wire and landmines. I'm sure more than one individual tried their best to escape only to end up on the receiving end of some of these implements of death. So whether the town is haunted by the souls of those who lost their livelihood or by those who fought against a dictatorship, it's an extra ghastly ghost town indeed. Coming in at number 1, Pripyat. Ukraine. Ah, the ghost town to end all ghost towns. Absolutely full of eerie images, from old propaganda to abandoned, weather worn dolls. There isn't a creepier experience than sifting through the legendary waste left behind after the Chernobyl nuclear meltdown. After this power plant melted down, introducing the surrounding area to more radiation than 100 times that produced by the bomb dropped on Hiroshima, hundreds of thousands of people had to be evacuated, and fast. For more than 20 years, nobody was allowed back in. Legally, anyways, because plenty of folks did go back in spite of warnings against returning. Who knows what the long term impact of nuclear fallout will be on this area? Generations of wildlife, flora, and fauna will be impacted, and the area will be uninhabitable for some time. However, these days the radiation levels are low enough that people can visit the town and take in the ominous vibes. See the abandoned schoolhouses, stroll through homes that were left largely as is since the day of the disaster, witness the destruction caused by the meltdown. The reason behind Pripyat's abandonment aren't that mysterious, but the circumstances surrounding the disaster, the follow up, and how things are meant to operate now are. Number 5 The Mary Celeste Probably the most famous mystery ship on our list today is the Mary Celeste, a merchant brigantine that was found drifting in December of 1872 off of the Azores with her crew of 10 nowhere to be found. The Canadian brigantine De Gratia found her in a disheveled but seaworthy condition under partial sail and with her lifeboat missing. There were also signs that something had gone wrong. To be specific, one of its pumps was dismantled, but once again, that ship was still seaworthy, and there was no hint as to why the crew and passengers had abandoned it. The last entry in her log was dated around 10 days earlier. She had left New York City for Genoa on November 7th, and was still amply provisioned when found. Her cargo of alcohol was intact, and the captain's and crew's belongings were undisturbed. None of those who had been on board were ever seen or heard from ever again. Among the missing was the captain, his wife, and their very young daughter. On December 23rd of 1872, during a court hearing to try and establish just what happened, Frederick Soliflude, who was the Attorney General of Gibraltar, ordered an examination of the Mary Celeste, which was carried out by John Austin, surveyor of shipping, with the assistance of a diver, Ricardo Portunato. Austin noted cuts on each side of the bow, caused by a sharp instrument, and found possible traces of scarlet fluid on the captain's sword. His the report emphasized that the ship did not appear to have been struck by heavy weather, citing a vial of sewing machine oil found 
upright in its place. Now, Austin did not acknowledge that the vial might have been replaced since the abandonment, nor did the court raise this point. Fortunato's report on the hull concluded that the ship had not been involved in a collision or run aground. A further inspection by a group of Royal Naval captains endorsed Austin's opinion that the cuts on the bow had been caused deliberately. They also discovered stains on one of the ship's rails that might have been bodily fluids, together with a deep mark possibly caused by an axe. These findings strengthened Flood's suspicions that human wrongdoing, rather than natural disaster, was uh, the cause for the mystery. On January 22nd of 1873, he sent the reports to the Board of Trade in London, adding his own conclusion that the crew had gotten at the alcohol on board and, you know, killed the Briggs family and the ship's officers in a drunken frenzy. They had cut the bows to simulate a collision and then fled in the yawl to suffer an unknown fate. Flood thought that Morehouse and his men were hiding something, specifically that the Mary Celeste had been abandoned in a more easterly location and that the log had been doctored. He just couldn't accept that the Mary Celeste could have been traveled so far while uncrewed. Arthur Conan Doyle, author of the Sherlock Holmes mysteries, helped make the ship famous with a short story vaguely based on the event, in which foul play explains the enigma. A 2007 theory, reported by the Smithsonian, suggests that perhaps the captain made the call to abandon ship in sight of land after the ship's pumps became fouled. Normally, it would be unusual for a captain to abandon a seaworthy vessel, but the captain may not have been able to tell just how much water the ship was taking on with the pumps broken. The ship was also slightly off course and had been battling bad weather, which may have prompted the captain captain to take the chance at land when he could. To this day, the crew of the mysterious vessel was never found. Also, despite many theories, no one can say with any certainty why the ship was abandoned. The Marie Celeste sailed for 12 years after it was abandoned, and uh, finally struck the Rochelle Reef off of the coast of Haiti and became stuck there. And it's still there. It was discovered in 2001. Let me know what your theory is in the comments. Number four, the Carol A. Deering. This ship was built in Bath, Maine in 1919 by the GG Deering Company for commercial use. One of the last large commercial sailings vessels, the ship was designed to carry cargo and had been in service for a year when it began its final voyage to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. So the cargo ship and its 10-man crew successfully made it to Rio de Janeiro in 1920, despite needing to change captains when its original one fell ill. But something strange happened on its way back to Virginia. A light ship keeper in North Carolina said a crewman who didn't seem very officer-like reported the ship had lost its anchors while the rest of the crew was milling about suspiciously. The ship was still in good condition when it was spotted from Cape Hatteras on January 31st of 1921 before it was torn apart on the Diamond Shoals. Another ship spotted the Carol A. Deering near Outer Banks the next day in an area that would have been a strange course for a ship on its way to Norfolk, Virginia. Now, if someone wants to fight me on that pronunciation, I swear I consulted a couple of friends who live in Virginia for that one. The following day, a shipwreck was spotted, but dangerous conditions kept investigators away for four days. When they went aboard, eventually, they found food laid out as if they were getting ready for a meal, but the crew's personal belongings and the lifeboats were gone. So what happened to the captain and crew? All 12 men were missing in action, with no idea what the heck could have transpired. A month after the Coast Guard began investigating the Carol A. Deering, a new theory was formed related to the disappearance of another vessel, the Hewitt, around, you know, the same time. The Hewitt was making its way from Sabine, Texas to Portland, Maine, carrying a cargo of sulfur when it sent its last message on January 25th off of the coast of Florida. When the vessel never arrived in Boston, where it was expected on January 29th, a search began. The Hewitt and her crew had also disappeared without a trace, and the popular theory questioned if the ships could have collided. But the lack of oars, life preservers, or other floating wreckage disproves the idea. But 58 men were now lost. In April of 1921, a message in a bottle found by a man on the North Carolina coast seemed to give the answer to the mystery. Deering captured by oil burning boat, the note read. Now the State Department began an investigation into the Deering and several other ships, and it was suspected that the Deering had been captured by pirates. Arr. Then the newspapers began reporting the possibility of a Bolshevik plot to steal the ships, cargo and crews and somehow whisk them all away to Russian ports. By September, however, it was discovered that the message found in the bottle, the only real evidence of what may have happened to the crew, was in fact written by the man who supposedly found it. Mr. Christopher Columbus Gray faked the note in the hopes that he could discredit the staff at the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse and take someone's job. It's a dramatic way to get a job, but hey, whatever works. The hoax had prompted investigations by the US Navy, Treasury, State Department, Department of Commerce, and Department of Justice. Without the note, however, the investigations fizzled out and ended without an official explanation. The federal government has followed numerous leads on pirates, mutinies, and more, but uh, they've got nothing. 
So do I. Number three, the Octavius. The cargo ship Octavius met its demise in 1761 after leaving China and setting sail for Britain via the Northwest Passage. At that time, no ship had ever successfully navigated the passage, and uh, the Octavius disappeared, proving it was no exception. A whaling ship discovered the damaged remains of Octavius on October 11th of 1775 and boarded it to look for survivors and cargo. When the men ventured into the below deck quarters, they found the ship's captain frozen at his desk, partway through filling out the ship's log. And the rest of the crew were similarly encased in ice throughout their rooms. Burr. The whalers snatched up the ship log and fled the Octavius, leaving behind all, including the first and last entries, which were uh, stuck to the desk. The log revealed that the Arctic temperatures and ice captured the Octavius around 250 miles from Barrow, where all those aboard perished on November 11th of 1762. The whalers, however, found the boat near Greenland, meaning it somehow made its way through the Northwest Passage, even with its crew frozen solid. Look, while Frozen might not be my favorite Disney movie ever, did anyone think to check in with Elsa or any of her ancestors? This just seems like a magical accident that could easily be undone. I'm just saying. Number two, the MV Joyita. This ship was a 70 foot luxury yacht built in Los Angeles in the United States and launched in 1931. Roland West, who was a famous Hollywood director in the 1920s and 30s, was the first owner of the ship, naming it after his wife, Jewel Carmenil, calling the ship Joyita, which means little jewel in Spanish. The ship spent much of the 1930s cruising the west coast of the United States under both Roland West and its subsequent owner, Milton Beacon. It became a Pacific patrol boat during the Second World War, patrolling the seas around Hawaii. Although she sustained minor damage after running aground and had some of her components replaced with lower quality materials, she remained largely intact and in good shape after the end of the war, and by the 1950s was being used as a fishing charter vessel. On October 3rd of 1955, the ship left Apia in Samoa to sail to the Tokolo Islands, a journey of about 270 miles. Only one of her two engines was running due to equipment failure at the last minute, but the journey was considered safe given its short distance and the favorable weather conditions. So it was carrying medical supplies and wooden construction materials on board and had no dangerous cargo. She also carried 25 people, 16 crew, and 9 passengers, and the journey was expected to last around 48 hours. The ship was reported as overdue three days later, and no distress calls had been received. Flying boats from the New Zealand Air Force patrolled the same area that it was thought to be in for almost a week, covering a huge area of open water, but found nothing. Finally, almost five weeks later, on November 10th, the merchant ship Tuvalu, traveling to the Funafuti Atoll, more than 600 miles to the west, saw a ship drifting ahead of them. The ship did not respond to hails from Tuvalu, and the captain decided to investigate further. Investigation showed that the ship was empty, the crew and passengers were missing, and tons of cargo from the ship was lost. So while the ship itself was perfectly fine and in no danger of sinking, there was some evidence that something had happened on board. Parts of the bridge and accompanying rooms above the waterline had been damaged, and there was broken glass inside. In addition, stained bandages were found on deck, along with a doctor's medical bag. The one working engine was found covered in mattresses, but with sufficient fuel for it to operate and the second engine was still partially disassembled and therefore non-functional. And all the clocks on board were found to have stopped at the exact same time, 10.25 p.m. Rather spooky. The communications radio was turned to 2182 kHz, an internationally recognized distress frequency. However, the radio itself was found to not work and was not broadcasting, something which may not have been obvious to the crew. Oh, and all the lifeboats were missing. Some of the story about what happened on the Joyita can be pieced together from what was found by the official maritime inquiry. Like, for example, it's clear what had caused the initial problems on the ship. Um, a corroded pipe, one of those replaced during the Second World War, was found to be leaking and this allowed water to enter into the hull. It is very unlikely that the crew would have been able to find the source of the leak in open water. The damage to the superstructure of the vessel seemed to be unconnected to the problems they were experiencing, but may have added to the sense that the vessel was heavily damaged. The attempts to send out a distress signal and the lack of response may have led to a rising panic amongst those on board. The fact that whatever had happened had occurred at night also may have led to a lack of situational awareness as the damage found was minor and would have been clearly recognized as such in the daytime. However, the decision to abandon the ship, if you know that's what happened, makes absolutely no sense. The three lifeboats were far less seaworthy than the you know, ship herself, and there were insufficient life jackets for everyone on board. Furthermore, the vessel itself was perfectly buoyant even five weeks later, and the captain would have been experienced enough to recognize this. So while it seems that those on board decided to you know, leave the safety of the ship in the night and test their luck in tiny rafts, why they did this is a total mystery. Theories range from pirates, once again, to a mutiny among those on ship. 
The crew were never seen again, and this means that 25 people met their end somehow. Furthermore, despite the damage, there was no evidence of violence apart from the bandages, and these themselves suggest there was enough time for someone to administer medical assistance. No trace was ever found of the crew or the life rafts. And what caused them to abandon ship in the dark, only 50 miles short of their destination, remains a mystery to this day. Number one, the SV Kaz II. So this is the most recent entry in our list, and it was found adrift 88 miles off of the coast of Australia, near the Great Barrier Reef, just five days after it set sail from Airlie Beach towards Townsville, Queensland in April of 2007. According to the investigation reports, it was sailing with a three-person crew who were not experienced sailors. However, what happened to them remains a mystery to this day. Many believe rough weather conditions could be a reason. There's blame, yep, pirates, or even communists for the same. The vessel was found in perfect condition, except for the one sail, which had been shredded to pieces, and the three men were never discovered. According to investigators, they might have drowned while trying to untangle a fishing lure caught in the vessel's rudder, but others believe that a sea monster could have swallowed them. In fifth place, we have Isla de la Municas, Mexico. Decided to kick off today by being an overachiever, this is an entire abandoned island. The island of the dolls in Mexico is like something straight out of a horror movie, but my kind of horror movie. Located on Tishuilo Lake, it is home to hundreds of hanging, slowly decaying dolls, thanks to a man named Don Julian Santana. Over 50 years ago, Don Santana left his wife and child and moved on to an island on Tishulo Lake in the Exocamilicos Canals. According to him, a young girl actually drowned in the lake in the 1950s, and Don Julian Santana devoted his life to honoring this lost soul by collecting and hanging up dolls by the hundreds. Eventually, he transformed the entire island into a doll-infested wonderland. Now, he began collecting lost dolls from the canals and the trash near his island home. He's also said to have traded produce he grew to locals for more dolls. Don didn't really clean up the dolls or attempt to fix them, but he rather put them up with missing eyes and limbs, covered in dirt, and generally in whatever ramshackle state he found them in. Even when dolls arrived in good shape, the wind and weather turned them into cracked and distorted versions of themselves. Don also kept his cabin filled with the dolls, which he dressed in headdresses, sunglasses, and other various accessories. Despite the fact that most people found the island frightening, Don saw the dolls as beautiful protectors, and he welcomed visitors, whom he would, you know, show around, charging a small fee for taking photos. In 2001, Don Santana was found drowned in the same area in which he believed that that small child had passed away. According to legend, the dolls and the island are haunted by the spirits of the dead girl, and perhaps even by Don himself. Okay, who wants to go on a road trip with me? Anyone? Oh, thanks. In fourth place, we have Pripyat, Ukraine. So Pripyat is an abandoned city in northern Ukraine, located near the border with Belarus. Named after the nearby river of the same name, it was founded on February 4th of 1970 as the Ninth Atomgrad, which was a type of closed town in the Soviet Union to serve the nearby Chernobyl nuclear power plant, which was located in the adjacent ghost city of Chernobyl. So Pripyat was officially proclaimed a city in 1979, and had grown to a population of around 49,000 by the time it was evacuated on the afternoon of April 27th of 1980. 86, one day after the Chernobyl disaster, making it younger as a city at that time than I am now. Although it was located within the administrative district of Ivankiv Rayon, the abandoned municipality now has the status of city of regional significance within the larger Kyiv Oblast and is administered directly from the capital of Kyiv. Pripyat is also supervised by the State Emergency Service of Ukraine, which manages activities for the entire Chernobyl exclusion zone. So following the 1986 Chernobyl nuclear disaster, the entire population of Pripyat was moved to the purpose-built city of Slavutich. At the time of the evacuation, the average age of residents was about 26 years old, and the city housed 13,414 apartments in 160 apartment blocks, with 18 halls of residence accommodating up to, let's say, 7,600 single males or females, and eight halls of residence for married couples. In terms of education, there were 15 kindergartens and elementary schools for 4,980 children, each with their own nickname, and five secondary schools for about 6,000 students. In 2019, it was announced that folks could start visiting the affected areas if certain health and safety procedures were followed, but I don't feel like visiting a radiation-affected city is high up on my bucket list at this point in time. In third place, time to visit the Bodhi State Historic Park. So formerly a genuine gold mining town, located east of the Sierra Nevada mountain range, in Mono County, California, and now a national landmark, it is known as one of the best preserved ghost towns in the world. It is named after W.S. Bodie, first name unknown, but rumored to be either William or Waterman 
who discovered gold in 1859 in an area now known as Brody Bluff. He tragically passed in a snowstorm that same winter and was never present for what came to be. According to pioneer Judge McClinton, the district's name was changed from the proper spelling of B O D E Y to B O D Y and then a few other phonetic variations to eventually B O D I E after a painter in the nearby boomtown of Aurora lettered a sign as such, uh, you know, an accidental typo that stuck through history, which is a good reminder to proofread your work. I don't do it enough. While the output from the mine is largely insignificant in terms of mining history, the violence and early endings to lives tell a different story. In a particularly harsh winter between 1878 and 79 claimed hundreds of lives, with many others perishing from falling timbers and explosions underground. So Bodie as a town grew to have a reputation for violence and lawlessness. And unlike other mining camps at the time, killings were uh, daily events. Robberies, stage holdups, and fights happened at such a frequency that no complete record could be kept. Reverend F. M. Warrington would describe the area in 1881 as a sea of sin, lashed by the tempests of lust and passion. The first of four mysterious fires tore through the business district in 1892, the next destroying the town mill in 1912, and another destroying the same mill again in 1898. The last of the unknown fires demolished most of what was left of the now ghost town in 1932, taking many lives way too soon in the process. So when the last producing mine shut down after 1945, very few people were left living in what was left of the town, and all eventually met untimely ends. One man shot his wife unprompted, and three other men from the town took it upon themselves to take his life for that act. So according to historians, the ghost of that man would visit the three men after his passing, shaking his fist and appearing as if he was cursing them out. Those men soon died of mysterious diseases and illnesses. Visitors to the area have reported meeting spirits that leave them feeling suffocated, seeing doors open and close on their own, and rocking chairs that may or may not have a menacing older lady staring them down, or even the empty chair rocking on its own. Though Bodhi might be a bit of a tourist destination nowadays, but if you remove anything from the land, like I'm talking like a pebble, you'll be cursed with remorse and tragedy. The park keeps a logbook of all letters and items returned to them, with each thief writing an apology note to Bodhi for what was taken. The curse is upheld by the ghosts of residents past who guard against thieves and protect the town's treasures. Okay, so kleptos, steer clear or be cursed. In second place, we have the island of Poveglia. Yep, another entire abandoned island. This one's a little creepier though. So the island is located in the lagoon near Venice and is famous for being one of the most haunted places in Italy. Tourists and locals alike are banned from the island, which was used for centuries as a place to exile the sick to prevent the spread of disease and contain the mentally ill in an asylum built in the late 1800s. Yes, I'll backtrack and elaborate. So in 1348, the bubonic plague arrived in Venice and Poveglia, like many other small islands at the time, and it became a quarantine colony. The plague on average killed like one out of three Europeans, by the way. So fearing the unbridled spread of the disease, Venice exiled many of its symptom-bearing citizens there. So at the island center, the dead and those too sick to protest were burned on giant pyres. So this included the tens of thousands of Venice citizens just dying on the mainland. Those fires would burn once more in 1630 when the Black Death again swept through the city. The small island was used as a mass burial ground, and ashes from human remains make up as much as 50% of the island's soil. Cripes, I, uh, I hope it's a good fertilizer. The death Deaths of nearly 160,000 people on the island have given it its nickname, the Island of Ghosts. A doctor at the asylum was known to have experimented on patients with crude lobotomies and jumped from the bell tower in the late 1930s after claiming he had been driven mad by ghosts. Decades later, nearby residents claimed to still hear the bell, although it was removed many years earlier. A report titled Haunted History states that some restoration work had started in recent history but abruptly stopped without explanation. Okay, maybe this is one spot on today's list that I might not want to visit. And in in first place, we have St. Elmo in Colorado. St. Elmo is a ghost town and allegedly the best preserved ghost town in all of Colorado, while also boasting the most hauntings and paranormal activity of any ghost town in the state. The town was a major gold and silver trading center and the hub of life for many pioneers, outlaws, and miners for decades. So it was originally called Forest City, but St. Elmo was settled in 1878 and became an official township in 1880 with the arrival of the first post office. So the residents of the town were forced to change the name because there were already too many forest cities in the area. So gotta applaud the originality. St. Elmo went through a massive gold rush, reaching the height of its population of 2,000 residents in only 10 days. The majority of the town worked in one of the four local Mines. The Mary Murphy mine was the most profitable mine and the longest operating, having produced over $60 million worth of gold while it was in operation. When the mines began to close down, the town began to dwindle. The Mary Murphy mine continued to operate until 1922, but was shut down when the railroad was abandoned. Postal service was discontinued in 1952 after the death of St. Elmo's postmaster. Now for the fun part, ghost stories. 
I saved the best for last for a reason. The most famous ghost of St. Elmo is Annabelle Dirty Annie Stark, not to be confused with the beloved Annabelle doll. This Annabelle is the descendant of Anton and Anna Stark, who arrived in St. Elmo with the Pacific Railroad in 1881. Anton was a section boss in the mines, while Anna ran the Home Comfort Hotel located on Poplar Street and the General Store. Oh, and both structures are still standing today. Anna Stark was known as a cruel and harsh woman who never allowed her three children, Roy, Tony, and Annabelle, out in the town to mingle or work alongside what she deemed the simple town folk. Annabelle grew up attractive and passionate for the town, and her love of St. Elmo was fierce. After the death of her mother, Annabelle and Tony inherited the hotel, and the once impeccably clean establishment fell to shambles. So along with the decline of the town, Annabelle began to lose her grasp on reality. The town soon called her Dirty Annie because she would emerge in filthy clothing and her hair was in a tangled mess all the time. Finally, free of the harsh rule of her mother, most people assumed this was her like quiet rebellion. Residents remember strolling the main street with her firearm loaded and hung over one shoulder, ready to protect the town from anyone who dared to threaten it. Since her death, it is told she can still be found roaming the streets. Only a short while after after Annabelle had passed away, the hotel was left to a family friend whose grandchildren were playing inside the hotel, when suddenly all of the doors slammed shut and the temperature dropped 20 degrees. The children cried and screamed, and finally the room returned to the outside temperature, and the door slowly swung open. Oh, that's not the only ghost story. Don't worry. A woman skiing down Poplar Street at dusk was struck by a peculiar sight of a lovely looking woman in a long white gown glaring out of the second story window of the Home Comfort Hotel. Now the skier was shocked. She knew the owner of the hotel was on vacation and nobody was supposed to be inside. As she turned to see what the woman was eyeing, she noticed snowmobiles approaching. So sidebar, snowmobiling is illegal in St. Elmo. So the skier went and advised the group, who promptly apologized and went back where they came from. When she turned back to look at the hotel, the woman in the window was still watching and she lowered her head, nodded at the skier, turned and vanished before her eyes. So curious and in disbelief, the skier went back the next day to find every window and door were locked. When the owner of the hotel returned, the two women searched the property with nothing to be found. So was it Annabelle keeping watch? Be sure to let me know in the comments what you think.